Hello, good morning everybody. If I could ask everyone to please take your seats so we could get started. How's everybody feeling today? <laughs> Welcome back to day two of the Aim for Climate Summit. Yesterday's speeches by our special guests and partners were nothing short of inspiring. And I, hope you, and I hope you left feeling energized and ready to tackle the challenges that were being raised with respect to agriculture and food systems. To kick off today's meeting, to, to kick off today's meeting please join me in welcoming His Excellency Mohammed Al Amiri, the Assistant Undersecretary for Food Diversity at the Ministry of Climate Change and Environment of the United Arab Emirates. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Lovely weather, lovely city, lovely audience. Uh, excellencies, esteemed guests, and friends, a pleasure to be with you on this most important summit. I'd like to begin my by expressing my gratitude to the Secretary Vilsack and the USDA and AIM for climate. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. This extraordinary event has provided invaluable experiences and learning opportunities for all involved and we are honored to be a key partner in this profound initiative. In the last several decades, the UAE has been leader in adopting a proud, a broad range, uh, sorry, a broad range of uh, new technologies, innovators in a wide range of technologies have come to the UAE as an early adopter. This trend, this trend continues to increase. Related to agriculture and environmentally smart agriculture, the UAE, the UAE is proud to have a big impact here. In the UAE, we have a harsh climate with limited natural resources, which make a big challenge for food production. Although we cultivate in the middle of the desert and we produce blueberry, raspberry, and strawberry, one of the finest taste brand blueberry. And I'm proud to be part of this company who produced earlier the scalp. We have a harsh climate coupled with a strong leadership and will. I am honored to be here today with a welcoming message to help to bring new innovation to the UAE. This is one of my top priorities. We want to continue to be that early adopter and do our part to try new methods of agriculture to improve not only the UAE and the Middle East region, but the whole world through your initiatives aim for c We may be a small country on the map, but we are well posed to make a big investment and take a smart risk to advance this, the environment and society. Speaking about society, we will 
continue to improve the state of the world holistically, which including societally, this includes gender equality. In 2023, nine is the number of women ministers making UAEs one of the highest rate of the female minister, minister representing, uh, representation in the region. My own staff in my sector, <laughs> my staff, women are 70% as a percentage. <laughs> of course, look no further than the fact that may my boss, Her Excellency Maryam Al Mahiri, is a woman. <laughs> I just want to share a short story about Her Excellency. I know her years back when she was assistant under secretary, and that time I was director of research and development. I saw my staff a little bit, not that much, doesn't have this much passion. I called her, Your Excellency, I need your help. She said, What do you want? I said, Just come and speak to my staff. Without hesitation, she asked me when you want me to be there. A few days later, she was there. She spoke to my staff. And at that time also, that's 60 to 70% of my staff also was a woman. I saw her words in the face of my staff, especially the woman. She was speaking from heart to them. That impact continued later on, and I worked on with Her Excellency in different position, and always she was inspiring me. Thank you, Her Excellency. In uh, 2015, we implemented a national strategy to empower Emirati women, created the Gender Balance Council, aligned the UAE's vision 2021, and Centennial, uh, centennial vision of 2071 with United Nations Sustainable Develop Development Goals. And in 2030, agenda including uh, gender equality. In 2021, reached the planned Mars, planet Mars, the first Arabic and Islamic nation to do so, with a woman, Her Excellency Sarah bint Yusuf Al Mahiri, leading the Hope mission as other of the UAE Space Agency. I want to thank Her Excellency Maryam for not only being a great leader but being an inspiration to so many women in UAE. Thank you, Your Excellency. In, conclu in conclusion, thank you all for the welcome you have shared with us. We value our partnership, and we work hard with urgency to address the world's most pressing, pressing uh, problem. Please continue to Paris us, continue and people that want to go ahead. Thank you very much. Your Excellency. <laughs>
and welcoming to the stage, Senator from Michigan and Chairwoman of the U.S. Senate Committee on Agriculture, Nutrition, and Forestry, Debbie Stabenow. Well, good morning. It is so wonderful to be with you, to see all of these incredible leaders in this room. Thank you so much. We are so pleased that you are here in Washington, D.C. Uh, if you are from outside our country, we welcome you to America, and we welcome the partnerships that we have that are forming or continuing right now. Uh, I want to thank my great friend, our great U.S. Secretary of Agriculture, Tom Vilsack, for his incredible vision and hard work, and his partner, Her Excellency Miriam El Mohari. Thank you to both of you for bringing us together. It's really a pleasure, truly, to be here at the AIM for Climate Summit. Uh, over a year ago, uh, when uh, Secretary Vilsack and I spoke at the 26th UN Climate Change Conference, we talked a lot about the potential, the opportunities with climate smart agriculture and forestry and what we could be doing in this part of the economy together. And since then, we in America have been working hard to make progress, including the president signing the historic investments in the Inflation Reduction Act. But to confront the climate crisis, we have to have both public and private sector partners, as we know. We have to have our universities and our nonprofits, the businesses that are here that are represented, the individuals that are here that are represented. We, we are going to need all of us. I know that's why you're here. That's why we are all here now. The challenge is too great. The risk is too real to do anything else. We know that across the globe, the climate crisis has slowed the growth of agricultural production over the last 50 years or more. Our farmlands and grasslands are degrading. Extreme weather events are destroying crops with alarming frequency, and the climate crisis is threatening our food systems with new pests and diseases. For all of us here in the United States, this is not a faraway problem. This is right now. Historic droughts in the American Southwest pose a significant threat to agricultural production today. Even my home state of Michigan is not immune in so many ways, including over a decade ago, climate-driven weather events destroyed about 90% of my state's tart cherry crops. And by the way, we also grow blueberries, Your Excellency. <laughs> So we'll have a competition. <laughs> and our Great Lakes are now warming faster than the oceans. My state is surrounded by the Great Lakes. The Great Lakes are now warming faster than the oceans, and our largest lake, way up north in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, Lake Superior, is one of the five fastest warming lakes in the world. So I'm glad we're here. I'm glad we're committed to this. And what does this mean for our world together? More than 345 million people, more people than our entire population, the United States, will be food insecure around the globe this year. By the middle of the century, less than 30 years from now, the climate crisis could place as many as 80 million more people at risk of hunger, and we know what that means as we are seeing challenges and people moving and, and all the implications of that. Our farmers and ranchers are on the front lines of the climate crisis. It's hitting them in the head every day. But the exciting thing is that they are also part of the solution and they are acting now. For the last century, American farmers have been at the forefront of agricultural innovation. And we have seen our farmers adapt and rise to the challenges of our time. In the 1930s in America, a combination of destructive farming techniques and drought led to one of the worst 
disasters in our country's history. We called it the Dust Bowl. Millions of acres of farmland blew away, just blew away. The skies darkened, a crisis of hunger fell over the country, but our farmers adapted. New innovative techniques to preserve topsoil became common practice on our farms. And it was a turning point in American agriculture. We are at another turning point now. Over the last decades, we have seen ecological consequences of how we farm. Fertilizer runoff fuels algae blooms that are choking our waters. Pesticides contribute to crashing pollinator populations. Our farms still release more carbon into the air than they retain in the soil. But the good news is that this is changing, and I want to share just one story with you. Mitchell Hora is a seventh generation Iowa farmer, home state of Secretary Vilsack. He is a shining example of how new conservation practices can confront the climate crisis. Mitchell now uses cover crops on his farm as what he calls an offensive management tool. The results are clear. In 2021, his farm had record soybean yields, increased organic nitrogen in his soil, which reduced his fertilizer usage by 45% and saved him $75 an acre. A 75% reduction in pesticide use and bird populations returned to his farm using cover crops as habitat. The cover crops also reduced heat stress on his farm. On one recent summer day, the dry soil on his field measured 126 degrees Fahrenheit. The ground was baking. In fields where he implemented conservation practices, the soil was 26 degrees cooler. His crops nestled beneath the cover crop measured at only 76 degrees. In my home state of Michigan, dairy farmers are turning agricultural waste into electricity. This is putting money into farmers' pockets and reducing the impact on the environment by improving waste management. These are not easy transitions to make, but think of the benefits. Climate smart agriculture and forestry practices like these have huge implications. In the United States alone, we can remove the equivalent emissions of all of the cars and trucks on the road through improved forestry practices, climate smart agriculture, and grassland management. Now, Michigan builds cars, so I don't want the cars leaving the road. We'd love to have you buy one of our wonderful vehicles. But think of that, the emissions from what we're talking about at this conference, the strategies, the tools, what could be done if we all really, really did it. If we took this to scale globally, it would be amazing. So we're now at another turning point. We can either make the necessary investments to support these proven practices, or we can continue down a path toward irreversible destruction. It sounds like an easy choice to me. Any farmer will tell you that they can see the benefits, but the cost to transition is the challenge for them. And so that's why last year, we in America made a historic investment of $40 billion to jumpstart this transition through climate smart agriculture and forestry and robust support to help farmers and renewable and rural communities transition to clean renewable energy. These investments will support our farmers and ranchers on their path to more sustainable future for them and for all of us. And they will provide new and good paying jobs as well, which is the great news on top of everything else. So here we are at a critical time 
for America and our world. We are leaders, all of us. We are leaders and we must continue to act. This is an all hands on deck moment. We need the private sector as well as the public sector. We have solutions to tackle the climate crisis. We just need to use them. Thank you again to Secretary Vilsack and Her Excellency Almond Harry for bringing us together for critically important conversations. Thank you to each of you for the work you're doing on behalf of our children, our grandchildren, and the children we don't even know. It's an honor to be here and to be your partner. Thank you. Thank you, Senator, for joining us today and for your insightful remarks. It's a pleasure to have you here with us today. Next up, we have a panel discussion titled Breaking Barriers, Insights from Trailblazing Women in Science. Please join me in welcoming our moderator for this next segment, the CEO of North America for We Don't Have Time, Dr. Shatta Chakraborty. Well, to all of you who are in the room today, you can feel the energy and we are made it to day two, but let's give it up for an incredible program so far. How fantastic was yesterday? <laughs> Hearing from Secretary Vilsack, from former President, Vice President Al Gore, and what I'm excited to share with you all is being in the room is of course important, but we are also broadcasting this to viewers around the world in over 160 countries that are tuning in, watching the live stream, and able to watch this on demand as well, and can also engage. So even if you're not in the room, you can still share these ideas that you're hearing as part of Aim for Climate and support the acceleration of solutions within your communities and around the world so we can really come together and collectively and collaboratively overcome this climate crisis. We have these dual challenges that we're facing, the food security issues and the planet warming. And we have some incredible women who are doing powerful things in their positions of leadership here in the United States and around the world. And it is through this leadership that we are going to share some of these solutions that we're bringing into fruition. I'm so excited to introduce this next panel of trailblazing women in science. As a woman in science myself, who has moved from academics to science policy, and now to leading a global tech company, I didn't always see other women who looked like me in the rooms that I was in. This is changing, and it's so exciting. And those women and girls that are tuning in from around the world, you can see from this stage today what it looks like to pursue STEM and to follow those careers that will put you into positions of leadership as well, because we need you. We need this to happen if we're going to usher in these solutions and we're going to overcome this climate crisis together. So I really look forward to sharing with you this incredible panel of women that are really showing why representation matters, because at one point you were also girls, and now you are women on this stage, really, really leading solutions to solving this climate security and dual crisis of climate that we're in. So please join me on stage. I'm looking forward now to welcoming Dr. Shavonda Jacobs-Young. She is the Undersecretary for Research, Education, and Economics, and Chief Scientist at the USDA. Thank you so much, Shavonda. Please join me. We have Ismahane Alaufi, who is the Chief Scientist of the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Ismahane, thank you. Please join me on stage. Thank you. And we have Dr. Sarah Kapnick, Chief Scientist of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA. Please also join me on stage. Thank you, ladies. So, 
it is such a treat to be able to have this conversation with all of you. And you are representing yourselves, your careers, your experiences, and also the organizations that you are leading the science charge in, in celebrating the solutions, really bringing them into fruition. So let's talk a little bit about what you're most excited about. I'm gonna start with you, Shavanda. What is it that is really promising from your vantage point that you hope to see be shared, accelerated, and really picked up by various communities around the world? So thank you. First of all, welcome to my colleagues here on the stage, and thank you for, for being with us today. Uh, you know, we heard yesterday about a lot of the new technologies. We heard about artificial intelligence, we heard about machine learning, seed treatments. Um, I, had, I, was, I had the opportunity to give a, a lectureship last week at the University of Florida, um, the New York lectureship, and I talked about what I thought it was going to take for us to meet the challenges before us. And if you don't mind, I want to just share those three things that I shared with that audience. The first is that we have to be prepared. We can't start tomorrow preparing for tomorrow. And so we heard a lot about that on yesterday. Um, just for example, if we talk about artificial intelligence and we talk about machine learning, those tools are useless if we don't have the decades of data, the centuries of data. I was in the UK and I saw soil samples back 100 years. If we don't have that data, those, those tools don't work. And so we, could, we, we started preparing a long time ago. And so we have to continue to be sure that we are prepared. Um, the second one is a push the envelope. That I feel that there is opportunity to take more risk in agriculture. That some of the transformations that we've seen, when we think about like CRISPR-Cas9, um, some of the technologies we heard from um, Vice President, former Vice President Gorn yesterday, you know, we, we've seen technologies that initially <coughs> people thought were impossible to achieve. Um, and to do that as leaders, as, as a leader of a scientific organization, as a leader, I want to make sure I remove all the barriers to ensure that our scientists have room to operate, um, room to fail, um, and, and potentially be extremely successful. So, th so that idea of pushing the envelope, let's get out of our boxes, let's do what we're doing in the room today, talking to one another, working with one another, and, 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 and taking on some of these big challenges together. And then, and then the last one um, that I will share is, um, uh, as a former track athlete, I pass the baton. In, in ARS, um, in the Agriculture Research Service, you know, as having been the former administrator, we don't do science for science sake, because I imagine many of you in this room just don't do science for science sake. And so if we don't take um, the proactive mechanisms to make sure that the science moves beyond the bench in the laboratory and into the hands of the people that need it, we failed. Mm -hmm. In agriculture, we have big challenges. We may need to make sure that we are passing the baton and getting that work in, in uh, federal laboratories is for us to work with a commercial partner or a private, some pr other private partner. Um, and then for passing the baton, we need to train the next generation of professionals. You talked a little bit about this for all the young ladies and, and young men who are watching us today. We need you. We need you desperately. Um, and, then, and then the last thing I want to say is uh, all the innovation in the world won't work if we don't use it. And so how do we increase adoption? And we need social scientists. We need communicators. Thank you for the shout out. <laughs> <laughs> we need communicators because if we, if, I know what I need to do to lose weight. You know, USDA puts out a lot of guidance on dietary patterns and nutrition. Um, why don't I do it? <laughs> so how do, how do people make the decisions they make? You know, what do farmers and producers and foresters actually need to see to be convinced that this is a risk worth taking? Okay, I have a personal trainer for you that's done wonders, so. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Ismanai, please, over to you. Same question, coming from the perspective of the FAO, there's so much innovation already here in the pipeline. What are you excited about? So what I'm excited about is that if we look back 100 years, we had our best time in terms of knowledge. So we never knew as much as we know today. So if we talk about the advancement of science, we are very much ahead. But when we look at the ground, unfortunately, we are off track. So we're off track of all SDGs, but particularly SDG 2 on malnutrition. So this is, for me, it's like it's a crossroad where we make it or we break it. 
And that's where really embracing science, technology, and innovation is very key. I was last week at the STI in New York, the STI Forum, and it was wonderful to see the HQ of the United Nations buzzing by scientists and people talking about really using it. So I think in terms of the voice of science, it hasn't been clear enough. It hasn't been maybe used enough. So what we need to do is bring all this science to really innovation, to make out of them the innovation that the people we serve needs them. And that's across many that Shavanda mentioned and also Al Gore mentioned yesterday in terms of genomics, in terms of nanotechnology, in terms of AI. All of these combines give us really big data and give us really a way to do better policies to get the impact we need on the ground. And here I wanna tell you for agriculture, if you Google what can sequester carbon, nothing can sequester carbon except the agriculture sector. So the carbon sequestration happens in soils, it happens in water, in ocean, and in cover crop, so a plant. So if we think about the agriculture as a sector, we have been given the wrong narrative. We have been always defending ourselves because we are emitting 30%, but we are the only sector that can increase its sequestration. And this is the only sector that although we are talking about 30% emission, we are not factoring enough how much we are sequestering. All the sequestration happening in the agriculture sector has not been quantified, has not been monetized, and hence we are the culprit. We are not the culprit, we are the solution. And that's where really transformation is very key. And that FAO, that's really our strategic framework, is transformation of agri-food system towards more efficiency, more resilience, more sustainability and more inclusiveness, and we are portraying it with the four betters, better production, better nutrition, better environment, and better life, leaving no one behind. And that leaving no one behind, I would put a huge line under it, it's women, it's indigenous people, it's youth, it's people in the South as well. So I think really transformation using science, it's very, very, very doable, and it requires that we speak up, that we change the narrative, and that we put more investment in really bringing those, as Sharanda said, those technologies to the farmers. And yes, the story in the north is very interesting, and you have been adopted so many technologies, but go in the south. Most farmers are producing still in the old ways. So by bringing innovation that we have on the shelf right now, we can increase productivity in Africa by seven, eight times, and we can sequester much more carbon so that we keep and we help ourselves move forward in the global development agenda in, in human international agenda as well. Hearing from you, I'm so hopeful. I mean, both of you, it's just, there's solutions here and we're moving in the right direction and we're collaborating, we're partnering. We have NOAA involved as well and it might not be obvious that NOAA has a role to play in agriculture, but please talk to us a little bit about what solutions, what innovations are happening that can support climate innovations across food and security. Yeah, so NOAA's mission is to provide reliable, uh, high quality, and also accessible climate, weather, environmental information. Um, it's what my co-speakers have also said. It's not just science on a shelf that you put away for a rainy day. We need to start using it, using it in all of our decisions, no matter what the weather and climate. And so things that I'm really excited about, one of them is the future of modeling, the future of how we know what's going to happen. And for us at NOAA, that takes uh, the place of weather modeling, but also seasonal forecast, knowing what's gonna happen for a couple of months to two years, decadal modeling, what will happen in the next few decades, and then long-term understanding of climate, of those extremes, the variability, what we can expect into the worst case scenarios and the best case scenarios. For all this, for the modeling, the innovation is taking place in knowing what is happening around the world today from our integrating our satellites, our information on the ground, autonomous gliders that swim through the ocean or collecting temperature and salinity. All of that forms to give a snapshot of what it, the world is today so we can move our weather models forward and understand that. For the seasonal models, knowing what's happening in the ocean allows you to know what the temperature or precipitation is on land. And so the NOAA's work of observing the ocean is really critical if you want to build out understanding of how a drought is going to extend into the next couple of months. Mm -hmm. You need that information, even from the ocean, to know what's happening where we actually live. So there's modeling. Number two, early warning systems. 
Um, so we traditionally think of early warning systems in terms of weather timescales of a few hours, but it's also increasingly taking the form of many months to many seasons. Um, for slow evolving disasters, those around heat and those around drought especially, um, have these longer timescales that we can have some understanding of them into the future. Um, with the UN Early Warning for All, we're really excited about all the things that we're doing in that space, and I want to mention one of the pilot programs that we have in Senegal. So in this program for understanding heat and heat exposure, we're working with women in Senegal to be able to understand, be educated on the science, be educated on what that means when the applications of it. But really importantly, it's something you touched on, was they also go out into the communities. So when a warning is put out, they go out into the communities and they're the ones that are telling people, you need to think about this in agriculture. You need to think about this with your children outside. You need to reduce the time that you're out during the hottest mm -hmm. parts of the days. And so that community engagement is critical when those early warnings go out to actually make sure that everything is implemented, but also to have those trusted sources in those communities working with people to be able to act because Scientists like me from the United States saying what's going to happen around the world may not be that trusted source. That trusted source is in that community, um, and that's where we need to act. I mean, I love that you just shared that example because we know from behavioral science that up to 50% of the variance in decision making comes down to how trusted the communicator is. The science isn't going to change. The data, the evidence, that's going to stay the same. That's actually getting where, where there's more consensus than ever in terms of the data, especially as it comes to climate. But how it's communicated, how it's translated, who's actually sharing that information so that it's received, so that it's acted upon in a intentional way that aligns to the reality of the risks that are being faced by those particular communities, that's what can really be affected if we apply trusted spokespeople and, and really create those partnerships and collaborations on the ground. So thank you, that's a, that's a great example. Please, please. Can I just add that USDA works so closely with NOAA and just think if NOAA just put their satellite up yesterday. Wow. When we talk about being prepared, all of the decision support tools that we've already developed, the, the, how much snow is California gonna have that lets us know how much water they're gonna have, how much grass is a rancher can plan for, for their grazing for the next season. All of those things, NAS, one of our agencies, we all work on, off the satellites that are owned and operated by NOAA. If they just started preparing today, we would be in trouble. And so every day it evolves and it grows and we get to be able to give a producer or a rancher another day, another warning, another heads up. These are the decisions you can make now based on the data and the information you have. And we want to put it in their hands. We want a, a producer, we want him or her to be able to stand in their field on their phone, put in their variables and know what to do. Um, and, and that puts the decisions in their hands. And they don't need to know what's working behind it. They don't need to know all the algorithms and everything that's working. They just need to know that when they need trusted data, it can be at their fingertips. Yeah, and maybe along that, Cheta, there's two points, science communication and data from the South that I want to really point right here. So uh, in terms of science communication, I think as scientists, we're so much into our area that we don't speak up. So, and, and when we don't speak up, there is a vacuum of communication that gets filled up with people that do not, do not necessarily know what they are talking about. So I have been really advocating a lot, particularly for young scientists, to speak up and to acquire the soft skills. Because if they don't acquire the soft skills, they don't acquire the communication skills, they can't say it. So I think we have seen throughout the different years that there's a bit of mistrust in, in what's coming out in terms of science, technology, and innovation. And that's really, we have to gain back. And by gaining back, we have to be much more transparent. We have to be much more clearer, but also explain to the people as that, that as we communicate, <coughs> the environment is changing, the data is, we acquire more data, we understand better. So prepare the, 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 the common person to understand how we get more information, maybe we have better ways of doing it, maybe we find out that the solution we used 10, 20 years ago wasn't the best. So this transparency and communication is key. The second point is really data from the South. So all publication, there was a publication in Nature just earlier this last month that says really that the majority of the data comes from the North. We don't have enough voices from scientists in the South. We don't have enough data from the South. And here I, I think AI, it's a great tool to balance it out. So we're working at FAO on how could we use AI to mine data in the South in local journals, in local documentation, in different languages. 
So the fact of peer review versus non-peer reviewed could help us, mm -hmm. particularly to bring data from the south, but also using different languages and the AI. And that's why I say it's the best time to innovate. We were never in this point in history. We have really to harness it and use it properly. An important Please. comment on that to add on is that the Biden-Harris administration this year is the year of open science. And we have really been pushing all of, the, all of the different agencies to push for our data to be open and for it to go out to the public as fast as possible. And part of the reason for that is that you put that to, those tools out there, you make it so people can use the data, use that information, build their new tools, build their understanding, um, and it has been really critical, particularly as AI is coming around, that those data sets are all public and that they're freely available so people can make use of them to be able to figure out how to leapfrog and advance forward. And we're continuously also hearing from the private sector right now around the world from the data that we are producing at NOAA on how critical it is to build flood risk maps, even in the UK or in South America, because we have all of our data open, our models open, people are able to take that, use that, and then start applying it to other parts of the world. This is what happens when you have a panel of incredible women and leaders <laughs> representing these expert agencies in the United States. The panel runs itself and you just get, <laughs> you get so much, no, it's fantastic. You get so much information out of it. It's question. making my job so easy. And I, I don't even want to pivot, but I want to also, it makes sure that we touch upon how you got into these positions and how we can cultivate the next generation of talent. And the women that are already in your organizations, how do you support them and ensure that they are getting that next promotion that takes them to that next position of leadership so we can have more panels like this, so we can continue to have uh, diverse voices in different rooms around the world, because this is also leading by example, right? What we're showcasing here is is sending a signal to those that are tuning in from around the world that this is this is what leadership in the United States looks like, and this is what it can look like elsewhere. And so, what are you doing within your organizations? How are you thinking about ensuring that diversity and inclusion is very much part of the ethos of all of the solutions that are already underway and that are in the pipeline? Shavonda, let me start with you. Okay, well, fantastic. Well, I'm excited. Um, I think it was um, former Vice President Gore who said yesterday that the administration from the cabinet level down to the sub-cabinet level is one of the most diverse and well-represented, you know, uh, leadership teams that he's, and that was his opinion, and I agree with him. Um, <laughs> I, I think one of the things that's been critically important is that our, this administration has been very proactive and communicative about the importance of DEIA, diversity, you know, inclusion, all of those things are critically important. And so we're not just talking about it, we're actually walking the talk. In the USDA, we have our first permanent DEIA leader reporting to the secretary because we're just that serious about it. Um, for me, you know, internally, I, you know, if I had my team stand up, you'd see what they look like. They're all around the room. I think that we need to demonstrate what it looks like and the power of having a diverse perspective in decision making and in programs. Um, as far as the work we do for the Department of Agriculture, um, you heard from our secretary yesterday, we're working to, um, to ensure an inclusive agriculture. And, and that's one that we want to give a voice to the people who may, have, may, may or may not have felt heard in the, in the past. We want to develop a system where, that, where we can be more inclusive of everyone being profitable, productive and profitable. And that's our indigenous community, our, our communities of uh, our, our African American communities, our Hispanic communities, all of our communities, our women, our veterans. We are intently developing programs that say, we know what our past might have looked like. We acknowledge that, and here we are. This is a turning point, as Senator Stabenow said, that we are changing things, and we want to be. We want to hear you, and we want to make sure that we um, serve you and remove the barriers. And by the way, and help you make some money at, at the chain at the time. So maybe to add to Sharanda, when you are a woman, you have. It feels. I mean, definitely, you need more efforts to prove yourself wherever you go, and as you change jobs, you need to do that. Mm -hmm. But I have to say that throughout my career, and I moved in many countries, I was born and raised in Morocco, moved to Syria, moved to Japan and Canada and many other parts. I lived in many, many countries and visited many, many countries as well. What I'm seeing that is really we need to do more 
it's have the right policies for women. Mm -hmm. So most policies are made for men. So that's the reality of things, and that's the history that we have been carrying out for so many centuries. So if we want to bring more women to science, we need to encourage them. So it's, I am with the positive discrimination, unfortunately, so <laughs> I would add, always go for a woman. My office is all women, and they're all bright from all over the world. And if I'm given a chance, I will hire a woman, always. But really, I think we need to do it large. We need to do it very large and be conscious about it. We are not reducing on the quality. We are not keep looking for non-competitive or non-qualified uh, uh, employees and, and candidates. But we have to give, for about 100 years, discrimination to the old woman. So we came to a balance. And I always, I want to really give you my, I love uh, a poesy from Baudelaire on, on, a, on a soaring bird and how really if your soul goes up there, you see things completely different. And for me, a woman and man, it's the two wings of a bird. So it is, so you, a bird cannot really, cannot flow with one wing or one, one wing that is strong and one that is weak also. So and that's where really we have to keep both. And for me, I'm all for positive discrimination toward women till we get that ever we think. Our innovation are all for men. Look about a car. A car shape is for a man, it's not for a woman. Luckily, now it's moving, the things are moving around so you can move your, your seat to where you want it and, and so on and so forth. But to really, it will take us a long time to think women and men when we are putting in place innovation. When it comes to agriculture, you look at many things in the field and we need much simpler things. The easy one of them, I was in Tunisia and I was meeting ladies that takes alpha alpha uh, plants. So they pull alpha alpha for, um, to make out of it plant, uh, mostly paper. So, and I, I looked at the machinery that the women are using. Most of them tell me it's too big for me. I can't use it. Sometimes I leave it alone and they will pull by my hands. So it goes to the simplest things. And that's really when we talk about sensitive, women sensitive uh, uh, innovation, we need also women transformative innovation. We need to think it at all layers. And I think all of us as leaders of organization, I'm sure we're doing our bit, but we need to do much more. And we need to create a woman club as the men club have moved things forward. And I know that men would like us to do it as well. I know that all of us, we have so many men behind us, our husband, partners, our brothers, and, and, and other people around us. But we need really to be conscious and to do it much more, 100 times more, 200 miles and more. And Ismail, at the yeah. risk of asking the obvious, why is this important? Why is this positive discrimination so critically important? just to get to the balance, because it has been historically, we have been given more chances to men, and that's why I, I think the policy is a very important one. So myself, as a mom and a scientist and a leader, I had my first kid in Canada, and I had one year off, and at the beginning I thought, oh my God, I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna lose my career. But luckily, the system in Canada was very, very inducive. I came after the year and picked up my career like if I wasn't gone. And that's beautiful. That example has to be really done everywhere. That's, that's uh, an example from my side. Yeah, thank you. Who does the Canada? Sarah, let me ask you. You've been talking about how these collaborations on the ground are of critical importance to ensure that these innovations, these solutions are accepted, are adopted, are able to be implemented, actually benefit the, uh, the communities that they're being designed for. So what about within the organization? How are you viewing diversity and inclusion within the, um, within NOAA? Yeah, um, so I worked at NOAA for 10 years before I left briefly and then came back. And so I had been in the organization for a long time. As a science organization, we have fewer women in many senior roles. Um, and so I came in looking at every single process that we have and talking about every single process. How is diversity and inclusion being included in every single process? And so at NOAA we have a strategic plan around what we're going to do, but then we also have an implementation plan. But then with that, with that, those things can't sit separately from the rest of the entire organization. There needs to be discussions about this and every single discussion, decision point, we need to bring in the people that are leading on this. 
Um, we also engage with all of our employees for our employee resource groups so they have a voice on the leadership table so about conditions that they're seeing, what they need changed, how we can innovate on it. And so we're trying to work on this inwardly, and part of the reason we need to advance the diversity and inclusion with it inwardly is that we're building the solutions for society, and society is not one-dimensional. And so we need to make sure that our teams and our thinking is as diverse as the nation that we serve. And so we're working on that internally, but then also externally, with all the engagements with we, that we do, with the work that we do, we also need to make sure that we're also engaging across different groups with also very different issues. When we work on coastal resilience around the country, in some places, coastal resilience is a problem of sea level rise and erosion. In other places, you need restoration of the ecosystems to have cleaner water and be able to have fisheries and aquaculture. So the problems around the country are, as diver are diverse, and we need to make sure that our teams can actually also address them and be trusted when they enter those communities. Can I also add, I think it's important for people to see people that look like them. 100%. 100%. And yeah, I think it's, so yeah, I, I just want to I just want to put that on the table. You know, um, when we go out into the community, if I'm talking to a room full of, um, say, black farmers, you know, and I'm talking to them about the things that we're doing as a U.S. government, I think it does carry some weight that I'm also African American. And I can relate to some of the things that the challenges that they're dealing with. I also think it's important, last week again in Florida, um, I had a chance to sit down with some young women and answer some of their questions. A couple were in grad school, a couple were graduating, we have two 15-year-olds at the table. Wow. And to answer some of their questions, they are so bright and they are so amazing. And for me, they need to know that this is what a scientist looks like. This is what a scientist looks like. Um, it helped me. Exposure is so important. I had a, a visit in high school to Georgia Tech. I'm from Georgia. For all the people who are not from the United States, that's way in the South. That's why I sound like this. <laughs> but I went to Georgia Tech and I had studied in, in high school. I was in an engineering program. But then I went to Georgia Tech and I saw graduate students who looked like me. And it was that time, it was just kind of like, wow. Like here's someone doing what it is I want to do. And I think that exposure is so important. And that's why in USDA, we work to bring as many students as we can into the department, um, into our laboratories, into our offices, into our engagements, because we know that if we expose them to what's possible, and who can't get behind the mission of helping to feed people? That's true, absolutely, yeah. And, and maybe talking about trust and communication, so I think us as women leaders could talk much more maybe to certain women scientists or also farmers. So uh, we just launched last week the, the status of women in agri, in the agri sector. And we're looking mostly at the rural uh, agriculture. And there do you see, you see that most of the production is done by women, but most of the processing and the trading and the money transaction is by men. And, and that's across the board. So if we are talking about transformation, we're talking about using technologies and innovation, we have to make sure that we are not making women even more disadvantaged. We have really to make sure that the innovation technology help us to bridge the gap for those women, be it the women in the field or women in the science. Both we sides. know that people are more likely to trust those that look like them. Mm -hmm. And rather than try to change that reality, let's actually lean into it. Let's use the knowledge that we have coming from social science and behavioral science to, again, communicate, to find those trusted spokespeople and to create representation so that we can advance some of these solutions and we could advance women into these positions of decision making and leadership because all three of you gave examples of why that's so important within your organizations. And so mentorship was really critical as part of this. It was critical for you all going up in your career trajectories to the point you're at now and you clearly see the benefit of that for those that are coming up the ladder. So I'm curious how you approach mentorship and how you think about, and I love what you said, Shivanda, because this is what scientists look like, mm -hmm. right? Beauty and fashion and science are not mutually <laughs> exclusive. They can be one and the same. Here's Thank the you. <laughs> and so how do we reframe what it looks like to be a scientist and how do we mentor uh, our, our existing colleagues and then the next generation 
coming up. Sarah, let's start with you. Yeah, um, particularly in the science where we also have underrepresentation, mentorship takes many forms. So it can be mentorship with people above you, but it's also people around you at your level. And like my mentorship in my community is people in every different industry. And so it's people in academia, in government, in industry. And often as women also, we face similar problems in our advancing our careers. It is the science and it's the work that we have to do, but it's also work-life balance and our children. I'm also a mother of two. And we find that even across all those industries, we have similar issues. And so finding your people of your mentorship group, be it above you or around you, is so critical. But then I also increasingly, now I'm at this level, I am mentoring below me as well. And I'm finding that in doing so, I learn a lot from the mentees that I have. I'm helping bring them into the field, encourage them to, so we retain them. But then also, um, with many of the people, that is how I also hold myself accountable to the values that I want as a leader, how I want to lead, how I want to think about what we're doing um, in the eyes of my mentees as we talk about the challenges that we face. I love that. Please. Maybe if I may, Jemba, I, I think what's the most important, and it's along the line what Shavanda said, that people want to see people that look like them. So I think when we talk about mentors and mentees, as you said, it's really 360. It's both ways learning. But it's very important to empathize. In my mind, what I'm seeing is that many women, when they became a leader, they became like a man in terms of thinking. And I think really what we have to bring, and we have seen it, we have seen so many women leaders that brought with them the empathy, that what brought with them the, the emotional intelligence. By the end, it is known that emotional intelligence is a little bit higher in women than men. Most probably it's in, in the X, in the X, in the X chromosome. chromosome, maybe, maybe, I don't know. But really what I want to say is I that- I can find the data the, to support that. <laughs> exactly. So, so it's very important for women to bring with her her history when she became a leader. So uh, as Sarah said, really leading by example is very important, believing in it is very important. I want to share with you, when I grew up in Morocco, I was thinking everybody is like me. When I did my first trip overseas and I was 24, really that's what got me to see that there are people that are not like me. They don't, they are, they don't have the same religion, they don't have the same culture, but still it's very interesting. As I traveled more, the more I traveled, the more I became tolerant to difference, the more I enjoy diversity. Mm -hmm. So I think if I, there is something to do with our students, it's really get them an overseas trip, all of us. So if we keep the population going around, seeing other people that seems different, but still very interesting, we really can bring tolerance, and I think we need it today more than ever with all the difference and all the conflict and all the issues we have in the world. So mentoring, but also giving an exchange, as you said, exchange, but exchange internationally. And that's where the UN, it's a great place. So send your interns, send your people to us, not only to FAO, to all other organizations, because by seeing the diversity and by seeing the richness in diversity, really people change their mind and change really even their career paths. They might think to go towards that and towards uh, leadership more. That exposure goes a long way. Thank you for sharing that, absolutely. Shavanda, mentorship. Oh, absolutely. I still have mentors. Um, once I get a mentor, they can't, they can't lose me. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, my, my team knows that this is one of my highest priorities. I know how important it was for me in, um, in my uh, tra you know, trajectory to where I am today. And so I, I make it a priority to mentor. We have a young lady um, shadowing us today from North Carolina State University, shadowing Miss Adams in Madison. I'm giving you a shout out. Go Wolfpack. <laughs> so, so, so I, it's just a couple of things I want to say, and, and I agree with everything that's already been said, but I don't know about you two, but I had to decide how I wanted to show up. And, but who was I going to be when I showed up as a leader? Did I feel the pressure to do it like someone else did it? And I won't say I started out day one being what you see on the stage today. I did feel a pressure to assimilate. Mm -hmm. I was at a university that was, it was, you know, every day was a tussle. I had to be really tough and I had to be, you know, you know very focused. And, and then I determined that that wasn't the right career for me. And I, I joined the U.S. government and joined USDA 22 years ago. From day one at USDA, I was free to be who I am. 
who I am. And even as a leader, being vulnerable, my team knows I like to laugh, you know. I'm Southern, <laughs> so I want to start every meeting and I'm all off track. They got to bring me back on track. <laughs> um, but I feel free to be who I am. And so when I can do that, I hope and I'm giving all of them the opportunity to be exactly who they are. Because if they're just like me, I really could talk to myself. <laughs> I want them to feel free to bring their perspectives to the table, to bring their challenges to the table. I want to support, I, had, I have two kids too, we all have two, I think that's a rule. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't be here I if I didn't have, if I, wouldn't be, I wouldn't be here if I didn't have the support from the people internal to USDA and, and of course my husband. All these people who help support me be who I am. And then the, the next thing I want to say is, as I traveled around the country as ARS administrator, the first female, the first person of color to ever head the agency, you know, people needed to see me. Mm -hmm. And what, the, what I felt the females needed to hear in the room is that we don't want to continue a culture of silence. Ambition is not a bad word. If you're interested in leadership, let somebody know. Mm -hmm. Put me in, coach. I'm ready to play. Because when an opportunity comes up, I want to be able to consider them for that opportunity, whether it be a detailed opportunity or a permanent position. But if we're sitting milly mouth, that's, that's a Georgia saying, <laughs> and nobody knows, it's not, how can I help you? Yes. Yeah. And then importantly, as women, we have to advocate for women, even when they're not in the room, especially when they're not in the room. Why don't we give Ishmahan a chance? I met Ishmahan three months ago. I think she would be perfect for this. So I think that we have a huge responsibility. I feel like my responsibility grows every day. With every position I get, my responsibility grows to, to nurture and mentor the generation that's coming behind me, and hopefully for the women who are coming behind me, that they see what's possible. Thank you. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. from you and from everyone here is the authenticity is really important. People can see through it. And that distrust that, Ismahan, you were, you were talking about right in the beginning, that distrust that somehow has now propagated through society and into science and expertise, we need to combat. And social science and behavioral science will show you the way to do that is to, there's no magic bullet, but to be more transparent, to really um, speak authentically to identify those that already have relationships with communities that we're trying to reach and support and, and collaborate with. And so it starts with you as an individual, as a leader, to, to be authentic yourselves and to allow that to really ripple effect throughout your organization and then to the partnerships that you're creating. So authenticity is key and I hope that's like a real takeaway that is heard in the room and to those that are tuning in through their screens. And so I wanna, Throw the same question now over to uh, Ismahan, let's go to you. Mm -hmm. um, mentorship for you and in the organization that you're in, how is that something that you see becoming maybe, maybe institutionalized? As a matter of fact, in the UN, really, uh, gender and inclusiveness is really institutionalized. So we have a mentor program. We are getting a lot of what we call GPOs, which is young uh, young professionals, and we are squeezed toward more women, absolutely. We have targets in terms of gender equality in terms of different levels. We are still not yet there. Uh, in, in the executive management, we are 50%, which is wonderful. But when we go to the middle management, we are not yet there. So there are certain stratas that we need to work more and certain levels that we have to work more on. And, and if I, if I reflects on the past. I think myself, my role models and my mentors have changed as I go forward, and this is nice. It's nice to read to see that your ambition, your aspiration, your model move with you forward. And, and for the young women, uh, just going around really what Chavanda said, to really, when you talk to young scientists, they, you, they, you tend to feel that they don't have a dream sometimes, or they have maybe barriers in their ambition. They think that they have this only path forward. And I think really the message that we have to send out there, everything is possible. Everything is possible as good as your dream, as far as you have the drive within you. The drive cannot come from what you see around you. And hence women, 
when they do a lot of efforts to go in one career, sometimes you find them, they have, maybe they are a little bit sometimes risk, less, more risk averse than men, but because of the need for more security. So sometimes we need to encourage them to move from one place to the other so that we help women to move towards particularly leadership. So if you look at the numbers, they are not good, sincerely. So we have at the university level about 50% women, and then you move and it goes down and down to about 2% in executive management worldwide. So, and that's really a trend that we can reverse with mentorship. We can reverse with the right policies. We can reverse with the right programs. And I think it is different, most probably in the US and Canada, the numbers are different. And that was something I learned when I, when I migrated to Canada in 2004. But I could tell you in the Global South, in the NENA region that I know very well, those numbers are really there, and that's a struggle. So mentorship is one of the way to do it, but the right policies is the major one. And by the end, sending a message out there that everything is possible. I mean, I, I remember myself that my first trip overseas, it was for a fellowship to Belgium, and I went and I applied, and the lady didn't like my file because it didn't have all the, the, all the papers that are needed, but that's what I could do. That's what I, th there was some issues on the process. And then when I was leaving, she said, Ismahan, you have 2% chance for this fellowship. I said, send it and let's see, and I got it. So if 2% got exactly into it, yeah. <laughs> so over to you, yeah. Yes. You. No, Sarah, so, so for you personally, and then at an organizational level, how do you view mentorship? How are we actually cultivating those relationships, again, amongst our peers and, and for the pipeline of women that could potentially serve in future leadership roles? Yeah, so we at NOAA, we've implemented that we're trying to make sure all of our senior leaders are trained also more in mentorship, and that is a part of the job of any senior leaders. You have to do that. But you also have to be trained in sponsorship, so not just mentorship and helping, but you have to make sure that you are identifying those people, helping make sure that they're getting the opportunities that they need, bringing them up. Um, and with mentorship in general, how do you cultivate that? Um, I think a critical thing, especially coming out of the pandemic, is through networking. Making sure that people are able to network, meet others, find new mentors that aren't assigned to them, seek those out. And I think, um, for especially for the earliest generation right now that are coming out of grad school, out of college, that are trying to embark upon their careers, and they've had parts of their careers so far has been remote, like getting back out in there and taking up all those opportunities that you can for the networking and meeting new people to be able to find those new experiences, to find those role models that you want to follow is going to be really critical as we come out of this time um, in the pandemic and people go out. You have all been so authentic and so vulnerable, and I appreciate it so much because many times you see women just keeping to the party line and trying to um, assimilate like many of us did earlier in our career. But at this point, we are, we're seeing the tides turn. We're seeing a shift where we can actually explain uh, what we experienced, what we went through, and what led us here, and make it more of a, not so much of a black box, but really be transparent so that others can follow suit and really learn from us. And so I know those tuning in around the world are really taking a lot away from this. And, and I hope that they will continue to engage with us and learn and communicate with within their communities as well and really share these ideas and spread some of these ideas so that we can see we can see it take hold right mm -hmm. really take hold and uh, that's that's how we're going to mobilize societal change so i'm going to ask you to go one in our final few minutes on this panel i'm going to ask you to go just one step further one step deeper one more little bit more authentic in really sharing a personal experience that shifted you to the leader that you are today. What would you tell yourself, the high school version of yourself, the younger girl version of yourself, um, the best advice you could give yourself then of what you would experience, knowing what you know now, what you would tell yourself then to get to where you are today? And those in the room, those that are tuning in, I hope that they will really listen keenly to this and take this message away and apply it to their own lives. So, Shivanda, I'm gonna start with you. Okay, so Nelson Mandela has a quote that says, I never lose, I either win or learn. Mm -hmm. And so at this point in my career, I look back on all the things that I thought were severely traumatic. My experience at the university, 
one of uh, the only female faculty member to, in, my in my department, uh, the only African American in the entire college, in a different part of the US. It was very tough for me. Um, then uh, my first senior executive, posec senior executive service position in government, I didn't get. I thought I was a shoe in and, um, and it turns out not getting that job was one of the best things that ever happened to me because I was comfortable. I would have been complacent and I would probably still be there today. Hmm. And so I'm learning and that I feel like all of us, my, my high school self and all of the young women and men watching us be a cup, use every experience to fill your cup just a little bit more, be an open vessel. Uh, you don't lose, you either win or you learn. Is when I drop my daughter, she's eight years old, my second one, I always tell her, because she's new in the school, she doesn't like it, I say, Sophia, L-E-S, learning, enjoying, and smile, because her teacher says that she doesn't smile enough. So and I, I agree with Shavanda. If I look at myself, uh, the teenager time, I think the most important is dream and dream big. There is no limit to dreams, and we can make it happen. And the second, it's persistence. So nothing happens without effort. So everything in life, it's a, it's a journey that if we want it, we have to do the effort for it. And I think for the young people, I think they have to have that hope, but they have also to understand that nothing is easy. They tend to think that everything is very easy in one a days, and I have that issue with my teen and my young girl. But really, we need, they need to come into, you have to learn. You can't read something in Google and think that you understand it. It's not enough. So you have to go deep. You have to do the effort. And to do the effort, you need to want it. And there is no career better than others. It's basically what you are passionate about. It's the area where you can give the most without really feeling it's, it's heavy on you. So I think really persistence and working hard and tolerance tolerance, tolerance, and embracing diversity. I'm a woman that has been working a lot for neglected and neutralized species and diversification. And I really believe that the beauty is in colors. The beauty is in many, many things, multiplicity of choices, multiplicity of languages, multiplicity of cultures. And I think really the kids need to learn that instead of going one path and thinking it's easy and short. Love it. Thank you. Uh, um, my first is be curious. So I grew up in the Midwest and I was good at math as a kid and I thought that meant you studied math in college. So I went and I studied math in college and I realized I don't want to just study math. And then I forked into finance and climate science. And jobs like that didn't exist 20 years ago. Um, and so I did multiple things. I worked at a bank. I had worked in an NGO. I had worked at um, my own company. I was an entrepreneur. And then I ended up in government, and I spent 10 years in government, and then I ended up back in a bank, and then coming back. So my curiosity in understanding these problems of finance and how we invest for climate solutions, but also how we understand the fundamental science, is what's taking me this whole way. And then creativity, because that's how we create solutions for these problems, by really trying to think new ways. But then the last part is community creating those collaborations, engaging with others. That's how we bring our uniqueness, our unique curiosity, our unique understanding, and that's how we put it all together to create the complex solutions that we need for the challenges that we face with climate change. Fantastic. Thank you. Well, I have sincerely enjoyed this panel. You don't normally have the pleasure of moderating women doctors, scientists that are leading the top organizations within the United States and around the world and making critical decisions that are going to solve this dual crisis we're in of food security and climate change and solutions to one will support solutions to the other. And it's women like you that are really leading the charge on seeing these solutions reach commercial viability and getting the policy and legislative support that's needed to further them along and to take hold in the United States and around the world. So from the bottom of my heart, sincerely, thank you for sharing your expertise, your leadership, what you are doing, and being vulnerable in sharing your personal stories and experiences with this audience here at this historic Aim for Climate Summit and to those that are tuning in around the world. Truly, thank you very much. Can I give a shout out? <laughs> <laughs>
I, I want to give a uh, I want to give a shout out to two amazing women, Jamie and Fatima. <laughs> Please, <laughs> they've been amazing. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much. Thank you, ladies. much to Dr. Chakraborty and our esteemed panelists for an excellent discussion and for your outstanding leadership in food systems and community resilience. Please join us in the foyer for a networking coffee break hosted by the Government of Canada. Make sure you tour the interactive exhibit hall if you haven't already. At 11 a.m., we have three fantastic breakout sessions, and then there is an exciting, an exciting lineup of speakers for the lunch plenary session, hosted by Crop Life International. We will see you back here in the Grand Ballroom at 12:30 p.m. Thank you, and enjoy uh, your networking sessions. And thank you for attending today. Welcome back, everyone. I hope you enjoyed the morning session. And so just before we get started, as someone who has taken a lot of time and effort, and on behalf of our team, thank you for being here today and for joining us on day two. A lot of you have traveled a long way to be here, and it excites me to hear you talking. It excites me that you are motivated to have conversations with the people at your table. I was telling someone last night that if I didn't hear the noise of conversation, it would make me sad because a quiet room is terrifying. And so, however, as I mentioned, people have traveled a long way to be here. And many of you are from around the world, eight, 10 hour flights to get here including some of our guests that are about to come on stage. So I would just ask throughout the meal if we could keep the conversation down. I promise we're gonna to try to work in as much time throughout the agenda so that you can have those conversations that we desperately want you to have. But again, if we could just keep it down just a little bit so the people in the back can hear the speakers, we would appreciate it. And so it is my honor to introduce you to our lunch host and keynote speaker. Please join me in welcoming to the stage the president and CEO of Crop Life International and a global advocate for plant science industry, Emily Reese. Your Excellency, uh, distinguished guests, dear AIM4 climate partners, it's my pleasure uh, to welcome you to this lunch and as we prepare to share a nutritious meal, I'd also like to pay tribute to the women and men that everywhere in the world farm to feed and repair our planet to bring us both food and climate security. It is an honor to be with you today, a day that both recognizes and celebrates women's leadership. And we gather here in Washington with a shared purpose, to build sustainable food systems that feed the world. We are here because we need food systems that are both less wasteful and more productive and which enable farmers to keep 1.5 degrees within reach, thanks to mitigation practices. And we do that by providing them with the tools to adapt to a heating planet. Systems that are fair for farmers and communities, that are inclusive and supportive, regardless of geography or gender. There are many challenges before us. 
Agriculture will play a key role in the success or failure of our common ability to implement the Sustainable Development Goals and deliver on nationally determined contributions laid out by the Paris Agreement. Agriculture contributes to the health of our populations, provides the raw materials also to decarbonize our economies. But agriculture's fundamental role continues to be providing food security. The number of children, women and men, facing life-threatening hunger has jumped by a third to a quarter of a billion last year, with supplies of staple crops remaining tight as the El Nino weather phenomenon further threatens outputs in key regions. Boosting food security and resilience is not a nice to have, but an urgent must have. And this is where countries are very unequal when it comes to risks relating to pests and disease. Climate change alters the behavior of pests, their intensity, geographical distribution, and makes outbreaks less predictable causing massive crop losses and threatening the livelihoods of the world's most vulnerable farmers. The FAO's recent report on the status of women in agriculture serves to remind us of the struggles that women face, such as irregular and labor-intensive working conditions, limited access to land, inputs, and financial services. It's alarming to read that if we were able to close the gender gap in farm productivity and the wage gap in agri-food systems, our global gross domestic product would increase by 1%. Sounds little, but that's nearly $1 trillion. This in turn would reduce global food insecurity by around two percentage points, just closing that gender gap and would reduce the number of people who are in food insecurity by 45 million. When women are empowered, when they have access to finance and innovation, they look past just the needs of their families. They understand the invaluable contribution that they are making to society and the environment. Like all of you in this room, I believe that when we work together, we can find solutions that are inclusive and empowering for all. Farmers need access to tools that enable them to mitigate and adapt to climate change. And the most recent intergovernmental panel on climate change assessment report, the, the AR6, recognizes the critical role of innovation in addressing the challenges facing the agricultural sector. The report calls for climate resilient crops and livestock and improvements in water management, as well as diversification in crops and income streams. As business leaders, we know plant science technologies help farmers and our food systems to adapt and mitigate climate change. They improve agricultural productivity and deliver food security. And we are committed to researching and developing those technologies that support climate change agriculture, to reduce and avoid emissions, and increase carbon sequestration, once again, to keep the 1.5 degrees within reach. Innovations in seed technology, like herbicide tolerance and improved weed control, have already resulted in over 300 million tons of CO2 sequestration over the past 25 years. And that's the equivalent of the annual emissions of the state of California. And with the exciting development of gene editing, plant breeders have the potential to develop seed varieties that can increase the efficiency of carbon capture, provide resistance to pests and pathogens, and even accelerate the domestication of new crop species. We must work together. Governments, business, and civil society to ensure that farmers have access to the innovations that can spur transformative change. We must equip farmers, large and small, 
with the knowledge and the tools that they need to build the foundations of a truly sustainable food system. And the IPPC report is also clear. We need policies and an institutional framework that supports innovation in agriculture to tackle climate change. Farmers face the immense challenge to produce more nutritious food using fewer resources, and this under less predictable growing patterns. Plant science technologies, including innovative crop protection, digital and precision agriculture, support farmers to mitigate and adapt to climate change, while boosting protection of natural resources and improving productivity. Now, we know that to accelerate systemic and systematic change in global food systems, we need to come together to deliver seismic investment in sustainable agriculture. And I take this opportunity to congratulate the United States and the United Arab Emirates for launching the Agriculture Innovation Mission for Climate Initiative. 50 government partners and 51 innovation sprints and counting, delivering change. CropLife International is proud to be one of the first innovation sprint partners. With $13 million invested over five years, our sustainable pesticide management framework, the SPMF, is accelerating the access and uptake to climate smart crop protection innovations for smallholder farmers in Asia and Africa. And only one year in, it is already delivering impact. In Kenya, together with partners, we are working to protect human health and safeguard the environment by serving farmers to understand their needs, to increase their access to affordable, personal protective equipment, to build their capacity to ensure a proper use of crop protection solutions, to provide innovations that enrich farmers' toolboxes and improve their climate resilience. SPMF is not only focuses on farmer training and stewardship, but also on building capacity across the value chain to unlock access to transformative innovations where they are most needed. Ours and many other contributions are making a difference to support local, sustainable food systems. And the success of these initiatives are founded upon our ability to work and invest across borders, building alliances internationally. And so we need to work towards a fair global trading system. Food today is produced along global value chains. In fact, one third of agricultural commodities will cross borders at least twice. And the number of countries, depending on imports, is growing fast. We need policies that enable and facilitate trade. Transparent and science-driven standards developed by governments are relied upon by farmers and traders around the world to ensure an equitable and non-discriminatory trading system. Now, more than ever, we must work towards harmonizing international regulatory frameworks to improve access to plant science innovation for every region, regardless of nationality, for every person, regardless of gender. Ladies and gentlemen, farmers need to produce more nutritious food with fewer resources. And this under less product predictable growing conditions. Their role in tackling climate change is undeniable, but it demands investment in leadership, education, training, to co-create regulation that sparks innovation to build resilience. Innovation that is accessible to everyone. In Shami Sheikh at COP27, we agreed to the impact of climate change on food systems. To enhance cooperation, we agreed to increase access to finance and technology. And I commend the aim for c initiative for helping us today deliver on these commitments. 
For CropLife International, whose purpose is to advance innovation in agriculture, aim for c is enabling us to collaborate, to mobilize resources, scale up support, and share knowledge to accelerate climate action. We continue to meet new partners and expand our own knowledge. And as we head towards COP28, we must build on this momentum together. We must continue to drive progress. We must build, consolidate, and strengthen the alliances we have made and the programs that we're delivering. And so with that, I wanted to thank you all for being here, sharing this meal together. Thank you all for your leadership, and please count on us to support you on this journey. Thank you, Emily, for your wise and inspiring marks, and thank you again to CropLife International for hosting lunch today. It is now my pleasure to introduce a leader who has been at the forefront of global policymaking and innovation for over 20 years. A diplomat and a thought leader who has worked on the front lines of peace processes. Someone who has played an influential role in UN policy innovations, from peace building to the sustainable development goals, and who has helped build public-private partnerships to solve global challenges at scale. Please join me in welcoming to the stage the President and CEO of the UN Foundation, Elizabeth Cousins. Thank you, Jamie, for that warm introduction. It's always a pleasure to work with you and your colleagues at USDA. And thank you to our hosts today, the Gender, Climate Change, and Nutrition Integration Initiative of the International Food Policy Research Institute, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, and the US Agency for International Development. And thank you to CropLife International for generously supporting this lunch. Excellencies, distinguished guests, this is an extraordinary gathering. Look at this room, an incredibly diverse mix of over 1,000 people, dozens of international delegations, ministers, CEOs, research organizations, scientists, civil society groups, farmers, technologists, advocates. This is exactly who needs to be at the table for the food systems transformation we need to feed and nourish people while also nourishing our planet. And kudos to Aim for Climate for making it happen. Kudos also for recognizing that any effort to transform food systems needs to ensure that everyone benefits equally. And today we'll be talking specifically about how research and innovation can explicitly address and help remedy gender inequalities across our food systems. Agri-food systems employ a third of working women globally, and in some regions, over two-thirds. Women are at disproportionate risk of being food insecure. And climate change, in all of its myriad impacts, has ferocious potential to exacerbate existing inequalities, from women in agriculture making 82 cents on the dollar compared to men, to gender gaps in land productivity in so many other dimensions. So clearly, we have work to do. Now, to kick off our session today, we'll first hear from three distinguished leaders from Canada, Honduras, and the United States. We'll then move to a fireside chat with an extraordinary panel of practitioners to discuss where they see the biggest opportunities for empowering women as agents of change for climate-smart agriculture. So it is my great pleasure now to introduce first Her Excellency Marie-Claude Bibeau, Minister of Agriculture and Agri-Food of Canada. Minister Bibeau has led international projects and was an entrepreneur in the tourism sector before her election to the House of Commons. Among her many distinctions, she has previously served as Minister of International Development and La Francophonie, 
where under her leadership, Canada adopted a feminist international assistance policy, and she is the first woman in her current role of Federal Minister of Agriculture and Agri-Food. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Her Excellency, Minister Marie-Claude Bibeau, which will be succeeded by a short video. Rooted in sustainability. Grown through innovation. Achieved through diversity. Delivered with quality. Sharing our food. It's in our nature. Bonjour à tous. It's a pleasure to be with you today. It's also a bit intimidating in front of this big room of leaders, innovators, but I'm glad to be with you. Marie-Claude Bibeau, I am born and raised in the Eastern Townships in Quebec, about half an hour from the border of Vermont. And in 2015, I decided that I would be running uh, with now Prime Minister Trudeau. That was my first uh, step into politics. I thought it was time to change government and I wanted to be a part of it. So I decided by myself, I consulted uh, a little around me. My, the first one I asked about it was my, was my son, he was 15. And I said, Mathieu, what would you think about it if mom would you know, go into politics? And I was sure he would say over my dead buddy. But actually he said, oh yes, mom, you're ready for a new challenge. So that was how it started. I haven't been asked, so I will leave one message and I will say it now to all the women in this room. Um, don't wait to be asked. Just go for it and when you feel you're ready. I had the, the huge privilege to be, um, to be part of this uh, 2015 um, gender uh, equal cabinet with Prime Minister Trudeau. In the beginning, we were being told that, oh, women don't have the big departments. And, but now, six years after, the Deputy Prime Minister, Minister of Finance, the Defense Minister, the Foreign Affairs Minister, the Treasury Board Minister, and the Ag Minister are all women. So I can tell you that we really have a feminist prime minister, and I'm very proud of it. So when I started as Minister of International Development, I had the huge privilege to review totally the international development uh, policy of the government. So I started a huge consultation. I had 10 years of experience in development, but I really had everything to learn about crisis-affected countries. And I knew that women would be an important part of this new policy, but it became obvious that it wouldn't be only an important part, but it would have to be at the heart of our policy. And I wasn't even, able, uh, I wasn't even comfortable with the word feminist at the time. And now I know I'm definitely a feminist because a feminist only means, and only in, it means, that we just expect that boy and girls, women and men, will have the same opportunity in life. So what does it mean to have a feminist international development assistance policy? Uh, it means that we do not look at women and girls only as beneficiaries, but we make sure that they are at the decision table every step of the way, that they are empowered at every step of the way, from design to implementation, and also as beneficiary, of course. So this is really how it works now. If you want to get money from the Canadian government for an, an international development program, you have to show that you have brought women from the very beginning and that they will be empowered through the project. And um, I will, there's uh, one story that I will always remember is that visiting a very, very, very small agricultural um, production, and that means, you know, one woman with uh, two goats and three chickens and not much, you know, a, f a few, few dollars a day, maybe a month, uh, a week uh, salary. And she told me that because um, we were there with our Canadian training project, she was able to double her revenues 
and she then was able to keep her daughter with her and not give her to an early marriage. So this is why a feminist policy is so important. And we all know, and Emily just said it, when we can close the gap between men and women, it has a direct impact on the economy of the country. So you don't leave half of your team on the bench. You make sure that everybody can thrive and be, be part of, of the social you know, uh, dynamic of a community, of the political, and obviously it, it has an impact on, on the economy. In 2019, I was named the first woman Canadian Minister of Agriculture and Agri-Food. And, um, <laughs> I had to take ice. Mm. <laughs> Sorry. And um, very proud of that. And, and I felt that I had an additional responsibility in terms of being inclusive and bringing women and youth around the decision-making table. And I will always remember one, one of my first big meeting. I came into this meeting, uh, and we were supposed to talk about the vision of the future of this sector. There were about 60 people, 56 experienced men, two women and two young people being there as representatives of women and young people. And I thought it was un unacceptable. And it was impossible for me to have a conversation on the future of the sector if we didn't have women and youth around this table. So I created the, Can the Canadian Agricultural Youth Council. 35 young, very dynamic, experienced, and in diverse uh, in every sense of the word diverse. And uh, we started the conversation with this council. And I can tell you that now, and many of my officials are in the room today, they could testify that now that when we develop a new policy, a new program, they turn to the Youth Council to hear their thoughts on whatever program and policy we are developing. It, it's really great um, to have this uh, resource, and I would encourage all of you to have that type of Youth Council, youth council to whom you can you can turn to and, and get their advice. I think it is very important. So today we're here to um, launch a call to action. So I would say let's, let's try to lead by, lead by example. And um, when I meet, when I, I'll go back a little bit. Um, I meet very often with women uh, farmers, of course. Everywhere I go, we organize round table with women Farmers, most of the time it's in the farm, on the, in the barn, and we have these conversations. And what comes uh, over and over again is that um, they worry about, you know, the, the, the balanced family and work. It's very hard for, for them to get involved because they are the first one to take care of the family in addition to everything they do in the farm. Um, it's hard for women and youth to access land to have the financing to start their business in agriculture. And it's also harder to network. And to, you know, it's very important what we are doing now. And this is when you, you have this opportunity to be with other leaders that it brings you up and you, you, you know all of these new innovation and, and you can move forward. And when you, when you feel you're the only one who has to stay home with the kids, well, you don't have all these opportunities. So um, I would say that what we are doing in the face of these challenges for women, in terms of family, I'm very proud that we now have in Canada, all across the country, a $10 a day daycare. So it's, going, it's being spread through every province now. And in Quebec, we have the privilege to have it for, my son is 24 and it was uh, $7 a day at the time, I think. So it's been in Quebec for a while, but in all Canada now it's being rolled out because of our government, and I'm very proud of that. And this is a concrete example of how we can lead by example, make a difference in the life of women, and make a difference in our economy as well. Um, in terms of, of finance, how can we give more easy access to land and finance to women? We have different type of programs. Farm Credit Canada, for example, has women entrepreneurship uh, programs. So 
we make it easier, we, um, we waive some administration costs and uh, give instead um, training session or mentorship sessions. Um, we also have in, I'll give one example, concrete example, we have a clean agricultural clean technology program. So the cost sharing um, is, is higher for women and youth. So instead of having to contribute 50%, for example, to get a 50% subsidy, you would have to contribute only 60% and get a 60% subsidy. So it's another way that we do to, uh, to ease access to money for, for women. Um, we also, we're also careful with our nominations. We make sure that we get in the pipeline different names and we have women and youth and, and diversity, you know, we have the diversity uh, on the list of the people who have the capacity to, to fill jobs and, and we really, um, we have to be proactive because if you only wait with the, to get the, the, the name of those who will um, spontaneously uh, submit, it's more often than uh, the, always the same um, profile, let's say. So I'm proud that we now have our first Canadian um, CEO of the Canadian Dairy Commission. Farm Credit Canada is also headed by a woman. Our veterin ve chief veteran, not veterinaire en chef, <laughs> is also a woman. Uh, in the Senate now, we have parity, we have diversity. So leading by example is extremely, extremely important. So I will just leave you there by saying, let's all lead by example if we want to build a world that is more inclusive, peaceful, prosperous, and sustainable. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Bibeau. And she is not the first or first over the course of our, of our session uh, today. Uh, it is now my honor to introduce Her Excellency Minister Laura Suazo, Minister of Agriculture and Livestock of Honduras. Minister Suazo became the first female Minister of Agriculture and Livestock last year. She was then elected chair of the Executive Committee of the Inter-American Institute for Cooperation on Agriculture. She is one of the top agricultural experts in Honduras where her career has focused on sustainable agriculture, food security, climate change, systemic risk management, and inclusive sustainable development. Please join me in welcoming Her Excellency Minister Laura Suazo. Whilst our guest is coming to the stage, I traveled all the way to the back of the room. Hey, everybody, I'm back here in the production booth. I was just curious to see if the front of room could hear me. I know everybody's super excited and we're having conversations again, but as someone who was sitting in the front of the room, hey folks in the back, it's really hard to hear the speakers. Again, we do want you to have these conversations but these individuals, our next speaker, traveled all the way from Honduras. That is a long way to travel. So if you could, again, please keep your tone down and welcome our next speaker. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, the Minister of Agriculture of Canada just said that she was a little intimidated because of the amount of people. Can you imagine me intimidated because of Espanol, English, no good? <laughs> but I would try. So, uh, good afternoon, excellencies, uh, distinguished guests, and everybody here. It is with great gratitude that I am here today to share with you a brief message. Great related to smallholder women, especially rural women, and climate change. But first, I want to congratulate the State Secretary, Department of Agriculture at USA, 
Thomas Vilsack, and also to Merwin Abheidi, Minister of Climate Change and Environment for the United Arab Emirates for organizing this summit, for their leadership pushing us and pushing these topics, especially addressing this important issue of climate change. And my gratitude is also extensive to all the staff and to all the people that make this event possible. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I also would like to, to thank you, USID, USDA, and also IICA for this partnership that we have on these topics. Uh, but most importantly, I also would like to greet all of you, whether you work for the government, for a private company, academia, or a group from civil society. You and I, are agents of change and agents of climate change. All of us here have a role to play to transform society and the way how we behave and the decisions we make in order to open the opportunities. In this case, I will focus on the opportunities for rural women and, or women in agriculture. Uh, agricultural technologies and investment should benefit women farmers as well as male farmers under equal access around the globe. I am from Honduras, a small country in Central America, very tropical, very warm, with a lot of tropical crops, and also, I think, a very a rich country on natural resources, still rich on natural resources, but facing one of the most dramatic social scenarios, that is that 7.3 people out of 10 still live under poverty. So I, I cannot talk to you guys without forgetting my reality, my context, and all these huge responsibility that I hold for accepting uh, the position of Agriculture Secretary in Honduras. Um, I was invited here to talk mostly because I am the Secretary of Agriculture and I've talked at Honduras. And probably because I am the first woman to hold this position in my very macho country. <laughs> Let me start from this fact. I am the woman to become the Secretary of Agriculture, not only because I had the opportunity to study with many scholarships in different, these prestigious universities, get many degrees or get good grades or, or be a good girl. No, I, <laughs> it happened because in my country, we had, for the first time in the history, the first woman to become a president of the republic. <laughs> and President Mrs. Xiomara Castro invited me uh, to help her to change situation for most of the people. And she invited me and told me to uh, kind of um, solicitudes, requests, and she say, uh, well, the first one is, can you help me please to ensure food, food security for all the country? That's, that's the third issue we have. And the second one is to help me to overcome poverty. So she say, do you think there is a way that we can improve economy of the country through agriculture? And I say, yes. I didn't think it very well at the beginning of my answer, but I have been for the last 15 months working so hard to be able to have food safety in my country, and it is not easy. Uh, our president, Xiomara Castro, is a social phenomenon, and I am sure uh, it's very brave and a smart woman to push cultural changes like recruiting women as state secretaries. 
I am part of the 59% of the female secretaries in my country. We are 16 out of 27 women in the same position. And I think and I hope this is going to make a difference in our history. Um, and here is the important point. If you as a woman hold power, I think you should use it to open the opportunities for other women as well. I invite all of you from those countries that have not had the experience of having a woman as president, you should try. <laughs> and you will see how things change in society and how more women took high responsibility positions. I think that women have been accumulating learning for thousands of years. And now is the time to assume different roles and responsibilities. We all need examples to follow or examples to make changes. Uh, just recently, I met in person uh, Secretary Marian al from United Arab Emirates leading this event with Sec Secretary Birsak. Uh, she impressed me. I don't know where are you now, but I'm gonna tell you before I leave, before I forget that you are a, a brilliant woman and you inspire me. And, and that's very good. I think it is, it's a miracle when somebody inspired another person. But when a woman inspired another woman, that's perfect. And um, we, we need that. In agriculture, it is important to highlight as well that agriculture is two words, agriculture. Agri means plants, soil, animals, uh, fertilizers, but culture means norms, behaviors, tradition, music, food, etc. So in order to make changes in agriculture and climate change, we must change culture. Climate change, <clears throat> it, it is not only about weather or about uh, temperature or emissions or carbon neutrality. Climate change is also about culture. It's about decisions that all of us make based on our traditions, norms, values, and economy. Culture influences research, research agendas, business, priorities, consumer preferences, and the way we relate and connect among us, among nationalities, borders, languages, links, and preferences. Women participation, being a rural woman or an agricultural woman, adult or teenager, is a still pending cultural issue in the world. So does climate change. A review of the recent research coming from FIO, from IFPRI, from different organizations and universities, those results struck me because data say that rural women or women in agriculture are still facing big problems about access to food, access to employment, the difference in salaries that women get is, is less than the, the co-workers um, men get, uh, access to financial services, uh, technical assistance. There is not a still a technical assistance specifically for women. Uh, education, access to education, access to land tenure, and uh, access to market the opportunities. I think women are not the problem. We are more than 50% <coughs> of the population in many countries. <coughs> Excuse me. In my country, we are 52% of women. 
And, and because of that, I, I also think that women holds more than 50% of the solution to all the problems that human society face. From now on, and from the COP28, I think it will be great if we create, we work with groups in our countries. We create with women groups new programs that take into consideration these aspects that limit women participation. Especially, we need to push development models that strengthen women's technical and technological skills, but with more emphasis on financial and technological opportunities. And especially with money management. If the women are taking uh, the, the power, the management of the money, trust me, their life will be fabulous, will be different. Happiness will be among <laughs> women. And uh, when I listened to uh, all the uh, Ban Ki-moon participation just a minute ago about sustainable development, when I hear sustainable development, for me, working with women in agriculture means women having money and the power and the control of the money. And last, but I know that this aspect that I want to address here is access to education. But not only to general education. We, in this world, still have a big gap for women going to study into careers like engineering, science, math, uh, all the technology, computing, uh, and as I said before, business. We still have to work on that. Um, so uh, there is another aspect that, that I want to address is that good in education is the need for scholarships. And not only from the um, corporations or the business, we, as a human beings who have a salary, can, can be part of that volunteer scholarship program for, for changing life of women. But uh, I have to recognize that uh, the investment that the huge companies in agriculture uh, made also are influencing changes. Uh, myself, I was able to study my, my BS and my, uh, one of my master's degree because of a scholarship from US, USAID. And I, I always uh, feel gratitude for that. But I got my PhD at Cornell University because a scholarship from Kellogg Foundation, which is a huge company also into the agriculture business. And um, I was able to go home and work all these 30 years or more on agriculture. So I think we, we must continue investing on education. <laughs> As I say, we need more corporations and private sector also, uh, besides the government, providing a scholarship to women. Uh, we also need more partners giving funding that, get, that can be rapidly invested on effective change with full participation of women from the first ideas of the projects to becoming themselves the owners of their development. We as, as government must prioritize investments for women and smallholder farmers that uh, include access to finance, aggregation projects like land tenure, industrial and value initiatives, and access to market. All these examples that, that I say are very simple, but, but they are not happening for small and medium farmers in many places in the world. Gender equality must be part of research and development initiatives. I think we all, all are committed that uh, also we encourage uh, other Aim for Climate partners to commit to recognize the benefit of the empowerment of women to participate at the heart of, the, of decision making. We are committed to support extension and climate change information service available for both for women and men to, to make their decisions as farmers. Also financial options for women who usually lack guarantees. guarantees. Um, small for smallholder farmers, women are good payers. They pay back the loans they get. 
then we should give more loans to them. And um, women farmers should be at the agenda of our government policies, strategic planning. But also, I invite you, all of you, to put women in general at those uh, especially agendas with agriculture, food security, and also climate change. Women and agri-food systems will help us to accelerate the, the way to achieve sustainable development. For COP28 and the next COPs, we know we need to work on more research and value chains, consumer preferences, regenerative agriculture, but also in ways to overcome hunger, food insecurity, and nourishment, just irregular migration, women exclusion, and among many additional challenges to climate change, we need, we must make all the process transparent, faster, and sustainable. You can count on us to strengthen the way of doing development work in our countries. For one, the use is a more effective and inclusive methodology. COP28 has direct connection to food and then to almost all of the sustainable development goals. And finally, uh, thank you for letting me share these few ideas about rural women in agriculture and also all these pending issues a change to make. I think we are all are responsible for that change. And that change must occur within changing our culture. God bless all of you and open the opportunities for more women to assume influential jobs that will end in a more equitable society, in a more sustainable and human agriculture as a way of living. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, and you kept this room quiet. I think it's <laughs> a deserved accomplishment. Um, it's now my great pleasure to introduce Isabel Coleman, Deputy Administrator of the US Agency for International Development. Deputy Administrator Coleman leads program and policy oversight across the agency. As Deputy Administrator, she guides USAID's crisis response efforts. She oversees agency efforts to prevent famine and future pandemics, to strengthen education, health, democracy and economic growth, and to improve responses to climate change. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Deputy Administrator Isabel Coleman. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, um, for moderating this session during lunch today, uh, and it's wonderful to see you. And also thank you to uh, both ministers, Minister Bibo and Minister Suazo. You are truly an inspiration. I feel really honored to be up here following two ag ministers who are both the first female ag ministers for their country. I would also note... <laughs> USAID has made some great investments over the years, like the Green Revolution, but investing in a scholarship for Minister Suazo today, I have to put on my list as many, one of the great uh, that we've done. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, I also wanna thank our private sector partners who were here today uh, with a special shout out to Bayer, not only for the work that you're doing with us in Ukraine, but uh, for the work uh, that you are going to be doing and I understand will announce uh, shortly um, at this session. When the United States and the United Arab Emirates launched Aim for Climate at COP26, we did so out of necessity. Today's climate crisis is animated by extreme weather conditions and events that make it harder to do the very basic activities that have sustained human life for millennia. Growing food, raising livestock, and reinvesting back in the community. In the face of this crisis, catalyzing greater investments in climate smart agriculture and food systems innovation is a priority. 
it is likewise imperative to engage with the communities that are feeling the harshest impacts of extreme weather events to bring their voices to bear and to invest in their futures. And it is necessary that we devote ourselves to new and reinvigorated partnerships that can spur the kind of innovation and, um, and commitments required to make farms, food systems, and communities around the world more resilient to climate change. The importance of partnerships was uh, a key focus of National Security Council, um, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan's speech last week, in which he noted that the first principle for the Biden administration is both to strengthen existing partnerships and to develop new ones to address the fundamental set of challenges that we face from food and health security to climate change. For more than six decades, partnerships has been at the heart of USAID's work. But to measure up to today's development challenges, we need to partner differently, more creatively, more inclusively, and more locally if we are to achieve the sustainable results that we all seek. Many of us here today have already forged new partnerships and made important commitments since AIM for Climate's launch in 2021, recognizing that innovation and research and development in agriculture are crucial to building a climate resilient future. USAID is excited to contribute significant funding, over $200 million for R&D, towards the total amount mobilized for AIM for Climate, announced yesterday an impressive global commitment of $13 billion. These are commitments and contributions that will go a long way and that we should all be very proud of. But today, I want to pick up where Minister Suazo left off, which is talking about how we can make um, these investments go even further, how we can target funding in research, development, and the application of innovations in agriculture to maximize our impact and drive truly sustainable results. The an answer is simple, and it's supported by decades of research. It is investing in women. To achieve climate resilient, yes, investing in women. <laughs> to achieve climate resilient agriculture and food systems, women must be empowered as change makers and have access to innovations that work for them. The FAO's 2011 report made clear, closing the gap in agriculture, in crop yields specifically, was going to be critical to ending global hunger. But here we are, 12 years later, and unfortunately, progress has slowed. The FAO's latest report indicates that the gender gap in farm productivity in low and middle income countries has plateaued at around 24%. Women's access to irrigation, livestock, land ownership, and advisory and educational services has barely budged in more than over a decade. This is, of course, due in large part to the fact that women are disproportionately impacted by the challenges that led to today's food crisis in the first place. But what is especially frustrating is that we have numerous examples of how including women up front and incorporating them in the early innovation processes and tracking gender specific outcomes can have cascading positive effects for families, communities, and whole economies. The latest FAO report quantifies the enormous opportunity right in front of us. If we can close the gender gap in farm productivity, we could achieve a trillion dollar increase in global GDP and a reduction of food security of 45 million people globally. Take for an example an innovative approach to increasing profits and addressing post-harvest loss uh, for women smallholder farmers in Ghana. 
designed by a USAID Feed the Future Innovation Lab for post harvest loss reduction at Kansas State University and in partnership with local groups and smallholder farmers in Ghana. Research shows that Ghanaian smallholder and poultry farmers lose up to one third of their maize crop within six months due to poor sanitation and storage capacity, 80% of which is preventable with proper drying and access to better storage systems. The post-harvest loss reduction innovation lab at Kansas State trained women and, and a poultry association to use new grain drying and storage techniques, which increase maize avail availability year round. And this led some farmers to increase their poultry flocks tenfold over three years due to increased feed availability. Others grew their profits by strategically timing their sales to higher market prices. Additionally, this expanded availability of nutritious, affordable eggs to consumers, especially women and children. Women farmers in Bangladesh were introduced to similar technology to dry rice, reducing their required labor from four to five days to a matter of hours. USAID's Feed the Future Innovation Labs brings together the best and brightest researchers, practitioners, and local communities to develop and deliver tailor-made solutions to improve crop production, conserve genetic resources, protect livestock and animal health, help farmers manage pests and disease, reduce post-harvest loss and food waste, and build sustainable farming systems. And they are demonstrating just how far investments can go when we prioritize women. We're also demonstrating the power of innovative private sector partnerships alongside our friends at Bayer who are here today and cocoa producer OFI. We're working with global cocoa producers through an aim for climate innovation sprint to improve climate smart practices for 15,000 cocoa farmers while ensuring that women make up a quarter of the farmers we support. And we're pleased to be partnering with Ireland and private sector companies such as Pixis and Malawi Mangoes in an innovation sprint that will help support the transformation of the food and energy systems in Malawi. I'd like to commend our Irish partners for their commitment to elevating gender specific components of this sprint. They're investing, their investments are helping to mobilize climate smart practices and adding value to commodity crops like peanuts and mangoes. So here's the upshot of all of this. When climate smart agricultural innovations are designed by and with women in mind, especially the most vulnerable, the benefits spread throughout societies by expanding access to cutting edge tools and technologies to households and communities across the agricultural and food value chain, we're able to increase overall prosperity and agricultural led growth. But it requires thinking differently, and in many cases, thinking more locally. And when it comes to empowering women, it requires thinking and investing with intent. That means making sure women aren't just in the room, but that their voices are heard and that women's ideas are incorporated in discussions about R&D and targeted investments. It means that women are defining what our specific development objectives are in the first place before any money is obligated. Because when women have the tools to succeed, they reinvest in their families and communities creating a multiplier effect that promotes well-being, prosperity, and stability. So my request to all of you here today, government, private sector, and nonprofit organizations alike, please develop strategies and forge new partnerships, including new innovation sprints in advance of COP28 in November that have a significant intentional focus on gender equality and women's empowerment, delivering on our climate goals and moving the needle for women and food systems worldwide demands that we think differently about partnerships. We must all be clear-eyed 
that we're only going to be able to address the development challenges of our time if we can achieve partnerships among the private sector, country partners, and local organizations to scale the inclusive innovations that we've all heard about here today and others. Together, I am confident that we can dismantle the barriers that have been setting us back. Thank you. Well, thank you all once again for such a powerful start to this session and for making absolutely clear the opportunity and the imperative of investments that yield tangible outcomes for women across the entire food and agriculture value chain. Thank you all. Now, before we transition to our panel, which we will in a moment, I would like to welcome to the stage Dr. Bob Reiter, who is head of crop science research and development at Bayer, who will take a moment to announce a new Aim for Climate innovation sprint. So, Bob, please to the stage. You know, I always wonder and I think a lot about um, challenges. And I think we have often heard the term, you know, farming is really hard work. You know, eating is hard work too, especially if you can't afford food or you don't have access to it. And I think the mission of all of us needs to be focused on that truth, that reality. And it makes me very proud being part of Bayer as a, having a vision which is health for all and hunger for none. And I think as being the largest investor in the private sector in agricultural innovation, I believe that I and my team has a personal responsibility to make as big a difference as we can and to partner with as many people as we can. Folks like USAID, different organizations around the world to really make a difference for farmers all around the world, large or small. And so with that, I want to announce today another partnership that we're establishing, which is our commitment to investing in something we call precision breeding. And this is a $60 million four-year commitment that we're making behind precision breeding. So let me explain a little bit about what is precision breeding and why does it matter, and maybe provide a little bit of context, I think, in terms of why does it matter in this discussion we're having today around inclusion and diversity, and certainly around gender diversity. For us, precision breeding is a culmination of honestly now decades of work that we have done in terms of how to harness the capabilities of data science, automation, technology, and our own expertise in how we conduct plant breeding. And if I think about how plant breeding has traditionally really been done, I would argue that what we do in plant breeding, and, and this is true in many technologies we offer today in agriculture, we create something and then we ask farmers to actually adapt to the technology we invent or create. And I think what precision breeding for me is, it's flipping that completely on its head and thinking first about the individual farmer and recognizing that each individual farmer, each individual farmer's field are actually quite unique and different. And so how can we tailor technology and create products and solutions that are unique for the individual grower as opposed to asking the grower to adapt it to technology. Now this wouldn't be possible without the phenomenal effort and phenomenal advances we've made in data science. And those have come about through the brilliant minds of our scientists. Many of our bare women scientists have made enormous contributions to how we've built data models, how we think about automating data collection, how we drive the data science, and ultimately how we can make this into an implementable system that is far faster and far more tailored and customized to that farmer customer. Later, hopefully when we have the panel discussion, I can talk to you a little bit more about also why it matters for the individual farmer that is a woman. Because the reality is, I think, that the needs are different for a woman farmer than they might be for a man farmer and we could go into a little bit of a dialogue behind that. So having a system like precision breeding, which is actually designed and tailored to take into account the individual needs of growers, I think for me is quite a revolutionary breakthrough and a great opportunity. The last thing I wanna share with you is, is 
agriculture, as you've heard many times today and yesterday, you know, we are in this, facing this incredible challenge. We're worried about food security, and at the same time, we have to respect the fact that agriculture today is still a net carbon emitter. And how do we flip this around and turn agriculture into a climate adapter and a climate positive impactor? And so one of the things we're also working toward is, and we've recently announced this through the support of USAID, our partnership with Erie, and our own in-kind contribution to working toward direct seeded rice, which to me is also a super exciting and really gratifying project to see how we can advance technology to make a difference in the lives, make food affordable, and ultimately make food accessible for those that are challenged by the difficulty of the hard work of eating. So with that, I give you my thanks, and I invite all of you to think about what you can help to bring to the table. We need a big tent in agriculture, and we need to work together to solve the amazing problems that are in front of us, so thanks. Uh, thank you, Bob. Please stay on the stage, and if I can invite the other members of the panel to please come up and take, uh, take a seat. you got great walk-on music, so come on up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Welcome to you all. Um, we've just heard three government leaders call on us to integrate gender equality centrally into our strategies for innovation and research into climate-smart agriculture as central to our success. Um, as we heard Minister Bibo say, we don't leave half the team on the bench. Clearly, empowering women across food system will require collaboration comprehensively across sectors and across the value chain. It will also require intention and deliberate action to ensure that our research investments have a clear and credible plan to tangibly benefit women farmers, women entrepreneurs, and other women across the food system. So to dig into these issues, uh, I'm delighted to be joined by several uh, Aim for Climate partners who have direct experience trying to advance gender equity through climate smart agricultural innovation. I'll introduce them in turn, and because time is short, I'm not going to read their bios. Their bios are extraordinarily impressive. You can read about them on the internet if you don't already have them before you. So just uh, in, by name, I'll read them off. Dr. Claudia uh, Sadoff, who is Executive Managing Director of the CGIAR, well known to everyone in this room. Kevin Perkins is Executive Director of Farm Radio International. Dr. Yuhania Saini is Executive Secretary of the Regional Fund for Agricultural Technology, known as Fontagro, and she is the first woman to have that role. Uh, and Bob Ryder, whom you've just met. So welcome again um, to you all. Uh, and we're going to do this rapid fire because we are, and I really appreciate the room as being still as a pin drop to hear what you have to say. So um, first, Claudia, let me start with you. Um, why is it important to ensure that climate innovations are designed and disseminated with gender, uh, gender lens? Well, uh, thank you. It's uh, such a pleasure to be here, and I'm so delighted to have a room full of people discussing gender. I think that the, the speeches that we heard from our, our ministers and the deputy administrator were so powerful in that regard. It's absolutely clear that we cannot solve the issues of, of today, of hunger, of climate, without engaging women in everything that we do. We know that women are disproportionately affected. We heard a lot of statistics. Here's one I find really troubling. CARE last year put out a, a report that suggested that 150 million more women than men were food insecure in 2021. Now, you probably think I just misspoke or you just misheard, but at the height of COVID, 150 million more women than men were food insecure. So these global challenges that we face aren't gender neutral. They have very differential impacts. And very importantly, there are four targeted solutions. We need to be extremely careful that as we seek to solve the climate crisis or the food crisis, that we don't strengthen inequalities that already exist, but that we are mindful and intentional, just as all of the speakers here have said. We also know that without specific targeting, to ensure that, uh, that, that women's concerns and access and ability and information um, are engaged, that we won't have the impact that we need. 
At uh, CGIR, we have, I think, one of the largest cohorts of highly qualified researchers generating evidence on all of these topics. And I can assure you, unfortunately, that the evidence truly bears this out. Without intentionally designed, administered, and implemented programming, we cannot uh, close the, uh, the, 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 the extraordinary gaps that we're seeing in, in gender. So it's really absolutely essential that we do this. And in the interest of time, because I know that we are going to rush on this panel, let me say that um, in preparation for this meeting, GCAN, which is the Gender, um, Climate, and Nutrition Integration Initiative at IFPRI, a CGIR center, a call to action was put together that I will be released in the coming days. And we also look forward to creating a sprint, a aim for C climate sprint on gender and climate. And I hope that everyone in this room will can consider joining in that effort. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and as much as I know you're going to want to clap after everyone speaks, I'm going to ask you to hold your applause to the very end, so uh, in the interest of time. Kevin, I, I want to go to you next. Help us understand a little bit more at a granular level the specific challenges many women face in accessing research-based knowledge and new technologies from your experience. Thank you. Uh, regenerative agriculture, climate smart agriculture is quite knowledge intensive. It, it requires a lot of information, a lot of opportunities to exchange, a lot of input and contributions uh, to the development of the innovations. Um, women uh, who are involved in smallholder farmers need that information and knowledge exchange arguably more than anyone, but they have the least access to it. Uh, just like uh, climate justice involves gender justice as we're discussing, it also uh, requires communication justice and creating opportunities for uh, people with least access to information to, to, to gain it uh, and participate in it, share their own knowledge and experiences as well. And there are a number of, for rural women in particular, uh, of, of barriers or challenges to accessing and participating in that knowledge exchange. And the first I want to mention is uh, language. Uh, the information, knowledge, uh, but innovations really needs to come to people in their own language. And there's, of course, hundreds of languages. And most of the technical information, most of the, uh, what's, what's available is not in uh, the language of the farmers. So that's the first uh, challenge. It's true for everyone, but particularly for women who are less likely to know even the, the, uh, an international language or even often the dominant uh, national language to a level that's needed for them to really benefit. A second area is, is around literacy. Uh, being able to read and write, but also technical scientific literacy and the need for it to be translated, the terms and concepts uh, such that they're accessible and, and relevant uh, to them. And again, this is a, a particular challenge. It's for the whole rural community, but particularly uh, for women. Another area is around access to extension workers or officers. And as we know, there's just not enough of them. The ratio of farmer to extension workers is, is, is impossible in most countries to uh, meet. But that's especially true for women. The ma large majority of extension officers are men, and for a whole variety of reasons, uh, therefore less uh, accessible uh, in most cases to women, in part because it's difficult or even impossible for them to meet privately or on the field with a male uh, extension worker, and sometimes just the bias that's there in terms of where the information is, is directed. Another big uh, area of constraint is just the busyness of the day. Uh, uh, women are busy from, from dawn till dusk in rural communities, and uh, the ability to take time out of that day to attend a training or attend a workshop or meet with an extension worker, uh, the services really have to be uh, made available and fit their very, very busy schedules. Also, there's the issue of access to uh, some of the newer technologies, some of the digital uh, advisory services require uh, a, 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 a rather expensive smartphone, but more than that, the data to use the phone, even beyond that, the extra cost of charging a smartphone. Charging phones is quite expensive, and a smartphone takes much longer uh, to charge. So that makes some of the digital services less available uh, to women as well. 
And underlying it all is just generally, as we've heard earlier, systemic uh, gender inequality, which kind of gives root to a lot of these other inequalities, and a communication uh, service that uh, truly addresses um, the needs of women farmers also needs to address these kind of cultural dimensions of roles and norms that we heard the minister speak of earlier. Thank you, Kevin. Yohani, I want to turn to you next. Um, tell us a bit more about Fontagro and how you engage with and support women scientists across Latin America and the Caribbean. Thank you very much. Um, well, Fontagro, which is the regional fund for agricultural technology, uh, started in 1998. Uh, it was a very important uh, mechanism for supporting the national research system and is constituted by 15 countries for Latin America and Spain. Um, I started in 2018 and one of the first activities I did is try to help all the scientists, women in the project that we run uh, to try to uh, get to the leadership roles, uh, which include be uh, the manager of a whole project. Something that is very interesting in Fontagra, and I really like it, is that every project that we run is constituted by more than two countries. Normally we have projects with three, four, five countries, and in each country there is a lot of diversity of uh, organization, public, private, uh, academia. So that creates uh, such a uh, diversity, um, just be, be in between scientists, culturally, that is a really challenge. So one of the activities that we do at Fontagro is try to identify all the women that really want to uh, lead those initiatives. Uh, we help them, but also um, all of them, all the scientists, with training. I share what um, the Minister Laura Suazo said before, that training is very important because in this time of the world, everything is changing so fast that um, everything that we have learned in, in our uh, careers uh, is improved by a lot of new technologies, disciplines. So trying to catch up with all those new environments to do science is very difficult for them. So one of the activities that we do at Fontagro is we try to design new training programs that keep all the scientists and especially women um, updated with all the knowledge that they need. Um, in another side, um, we, this year, we started to have a committee on women. Uh, we launched a webinar that was very, very interesting. And we agree uh, that one scientist that already is leading a project has to train another woman. And this is something that I would like to call all the women that we are in the room. If we have the chance to do mentoring to other people, I think it's also very important to show them that there is no barriers. It's just ourselves that we need to get the knowledge and wait for the opportunity and just take the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Bob, I want to come next to you. You've talked about how Bayer is increasing its investment in climate smart agriculture. And I want to hear a little bit more from you about how you see the opportunity of integrating gender equity into your research portfolio. Yeah, and I think about it in two ways. So the first is, um, anyone that is out there today, and I talk to a lot of companies that are out there trying to recruit the very best talent and the most capable scientists, um, you have to recognize that that has to be a pool that is diverse and representative of society. And that means it has to be a gender equitable pool and you wanna have a gender equitable team because the data is absolutely clear and the experience of ours as any other company is absolutely clear. Our best performing teams, our most innovative teams, are gender equitable. It's pretty easy math, <laughs> right? Um, and so we are very, very strongly committed to that. Um, but it's a journey for us as well, right? I I'm not gonna tell you that bear crop science R&D is perfect today. I have segments of my organization that are gender equitable and I have other segments that today are not and that is work in progress that we have to work toward. Because why? because we wanna have the best talent, we wanna have the most innovative teams working on these amazing and challenging problems that we're facing in egg. And then the second piece of it is, is recognizing, and I think again, this is what I alluded to earlier, we have to recognize and understand our customers. And we have, you know, we have tens of millions of customers, particularly in smallholder markets, that are women. And their needs are not exactly the same as 
another smallholder farmer, even in the same region or country, or even village, as a man potentially. And, and the way you have to think about that is, if a woman is responsible for producing the food on the farm, how do they allocate their time? I suspect it could be different than the way the man is allocating time in that same village or in that same family or in that same culture. We could think of the fact that women predominantly are also probably the ones that are taking that food from the farm and turning it into a meal. That means they have better insight and different insights into the needs and requirements of what that food should be as we produce it. So I think of as we peel the onion back a little bit and we recognize that these differences are material and impactful and we need to use innovation to basically fit those needs, then I think we can ultimately be more successful. So for me, it's bookends. It's who's gonna create this great innovation and who's gonna use that great innovation and those, those two spaces, they have, to, they have to be reflective of the inclusion and diversity that we all aspire to. Yeah, terrific, um, and we do have permission from the hosts and organizers to go a little bit over time, so we're gonna do one more round uh, with you all, and we could have so much more time with you, so uh, we'll take as much as we can get. Um, Claudia, I wanna come back to you. Um, CGAR is doubling down on its partnership strategy. I've heard, and you talk about uh, partnerships a lot. Can you say more about how that approach is manifesting practically in terms of benefiting women um, from the research you do and support? Right, thanks. We are, we are, we are very intentional about our partnership strategy. In, in the overall theory of change that we have for CGIR research, we actually have three points at which we partner. We partner upstream in deciding what is it that we need to research. We partner during the creation of our solutions so that we're sure that they're right and appropriate. And then we partner again at the scaling out, the uptake, the delivery stage as well. So we try at each one of those points to ensure that we're with the right partners. And in the context of gender in particular, this gives us a lot of opportunities. So for example, as, as Bob was just saying, there are actually quite gender specific preferences for what we breed. We have a G plus tool in one of our new initiatives, which allows us to look at gender sensitive or de gender disaggregated prioritization for what we breed. In terms of developing the solutions themselves, we have a number of initiatives now that look at communicating advisories, for example, and these were a lot of the, uh, a lot of the challenges that Kevin just spoke to. Are they being communicated in the right ways and the right methods and the right languages to really move out and, 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 and be seen? Um, and then finally, when we really deliver into the field specifically with regard to gender, we're working quite a lot with grassroots women organizations. The Self-Employed uh, Women's Association in India, for example, and Groots in Kenya. By working with these, user, these grassroots women organizations, not only are we really directing the technical assistance and the solutions directly to women, and that has really been quite a problem in the past, if you don't target delivery of the solutions, training of the solutions, uh, digital literacy, financial literacy, et cetera, directly into the field, then uh, we don't see proportional uptake. So by working directly with those grassroots women organizations, not only does our solution have more impact, but we also strengthen these platforms which are important for women in so many ways in terms of building community resilience and, uh, and, uh, and voice and, and agency. So partnership is extremely important to ensure that we do the right uh, focus on the right issues, we create solutions that are appropriate and demanded, and that we really work from the very beginning to design for scale and uptake. And gender needs to be a concern in every, in every step in that chain. No, thank you. Um, and Kevin, I want to go uh, again to you. Um, so you talked about some of the challenges that, uh, that women may face uh, around the world. Um, and through your work at Farm Radio International, can you go down a little deeper into the ICT dimension of things and how information and communication technologies can support innovation by women farmers? Sure. Uh, well, our approach really at Farm Radio has been to, to start with what works what already, what people are already using, what they're already comfortable with and familiar with, and that's, that's radio. Uh, and radio is really great. Uh, I know I, I sometimes speak to people about oh, using radio and I see their shoulders slump because much more excited about the new and shiny uh, things, but radio is still 
uh, a very important way and it, it addresses many of the challenges I just spoke of. It, it's offered in the languages of the listeners. It uh, overcomes any literacy barriers. It, uh, it can be listened to. It's a, it's a wonderful multitasker. Uh, it's affordable and accessible and, and, and so on. Further, the, the broadcasters, when, when worked with well and supported and connected with other stakeholders, really become science communicators. They, uh, with the right support, are the ones who can be the interface helping to explain and, uh, and, and support listeners in understanding and acting on, on the science, which is why we work with radio stations, about 1,400 of them across sub-Saharan Africa. But radio does have its limitations. There's, there's potential it doesn't meet conventionally. It's a one-way communication tool normally from the broadcaster to the listener. And, and we all know that communication is more effective and it's a, it's a dialogue, it's an exchange, it's a conversation. Secondly, it's not available on demand. If you miss it when it's on being broadcast, you don't get access to the information normally. Uh, and thirdly, the, one of the benefits of digital tools is you got, have data, tremendous amount of data about who's using, how they're using, and what their realities are. And radio doesn't do those things very well. But that's why we've been really focusing on, on integrating radio with digital tools, especially interactive voice response and some of the communication applications like WhatsApp, Telegram, and others things that can use basic mobile technology, but they allow for radio to be more interactive, for the contents of radio programs to be shared in, in small segments out through WhatsApp groups, for example. Uh, one of the things that, that we developed that was really fascinating that has to do with this topic is something called scaling her voice on air, no, her voice on air. It's a type of radio program. Uh, most radio stations invite their listeners and communities to form groups, community listening groups. And very often those groups are mainly or entirely made up of women. So in this approach, the broadcaster invites the groups to think about a question, a question about uh, crops to be grown or the equitable division of labor at home, any number of questions, one question per episode, and invites the uh, groups to think about it and phone a number, an interactive voice response system and then share what their group's view is on that question. The radio broadcaster then takes all of this beautiful content and turns it into kind of an audio uh, mosaic, a collage of audio snippets from communities right across the listening area, puts it on the air, and it's fantastic content that really starts to shift uh, people's attitudes and appreciation of gender equality, but also uh, climate smart agriculture and so on. So that's just an example of the kind of approaches we've taken. The real innovation is around the process and the approach of really bringing in various stakeholder groups, providing the right support to the radio stations and the broadcasters, integrating the other ICTs in uh, and so forth, and it works. Uh, the, the, the evaluations that we've done, but others have done as well, show that uh, when they're done this way, when women are really engaged, when their voices are on the air, when they're given access uh, uh, to the communication technology, they listen in huge numbers. In fact, an evaluation recently of uh, 16 programs, uh, 16 radio stations that developed in programs across Ghana found that three quarters, three out of four, uh, women under 34 listened regularly. The average across the population was 66%, so still very high, but it was most high among that important demographic of young women. Um, and in terms of uh, leading to the uptake of new practices, same evaluation found that ex listening and participating in these uh, platforms increased by 25 to 46 percent the probability that they would take up uh, a new practice featured in the program. Thank you um, for that. And I, you talked about um, young women, and I want to turn Johanna to you. Um, you've talked about mentoring, you've talked about training. What more can we do to support the next generation of women scientists, both in agricultural research and, frankly, beyond? Well, I think in my experience working with uh, at least three, four hundred scientists in different countries, um, women really value when you give opportunities to get training. And maybe a program uh, like an internship um, with digital training. I think that all the digital technologies really help them 
because I allow them to get the training without need to travel or leave from their um, towns or, or houses. So that is very important. Uh, mentoring is the second um, uh, aspect that I will highlight. And third is um, some training in finance. Uh, I think, uh, and this is not just for women, I, I see this in all the scientist uh, community and also small and medium farmers. Training in finance, uh, I think is very important. We can do it online. There is a lot, actually I'm taking one just to try how this works. And, um, and then try to talk with the uh, multilateral banks or those organizations that are able to finance uh, to create new financial mechanisms. Uh, adapted to them. Uh, this is very important because um, from all the experiences that we were hearing today in this panel and other panels, when you really give the opportunity uh, to a scientist, women, small farmer, also women that are small holders, uh, they are very good at that if you give them the right tools, the right knowledge. So I think these three points is what I will do uh, if I have the chance. Thank you. Thank you. And Bob, a slightly different question, but following very much on from Eugenia's last point. Um, it's no secret that large companies, uh, large farms, have been the biggest beneficiaries historically of, uh, of research investments. How does a company like Bayer think about evolving its research strategy to orient more toward the smallholder side of the spectrum, and of course, women in particular? Yeah, um, I actually would not quite agree with that okay. statement. And, and my belief, honestly, is that much of the innovation that we work on and have developed in, and others have delivered to the farm um, actually is quite scale neutral. Um, I think the challenge we face often is that for economic reasons or other obstacles, we're not very good at getting that technology adapted to the smallholder markets. And that's, I think, the reality. Um, I think about, as I mentioned earlier, our effort in precision breeding or the things we've done before that, biotechnology, these are all very scale neutral technologies. If we can get them into the hands successfully of smallholder farmers, especially women farmers, and then we have markets for those farmers when they're successful in using those technologies. So I think for me it's, it's really how do we focus on making sure that um, farmers, in particular women farmers, since they disproportionately represent such a large number in smallholder markets, is that what are we going to do to help de-risk and help to underpin them as we want them to adapt technologies that are going to make a meaningful difference for their lives and for the lives of the people that will be fed by their output. And, and I think that's where we need to focus, really, really focus the effort because I think the technology, it, it can do it. Um, but we need, to, we need to adapt it uh, ultimately to the needs. Yeah, terrific. Um, we are now getting close to the end of our session. I want to give you all a chance for a quick lightning round of just a final reflection to share with participants. Um, and I'll go in reverse order if that's okay, starting with you, Bob. For me, it's beak. I think about it in particular with this topic of inclusion and diversity and gender inclusion and diversity. Be committed, have a plan, and work with others. Eugenia. Um, for us is um, increase um, the partnerships and alliances with other partners and try to get more impact in the field. Uh, and for that, we need more engagement with the private sector, public and private sector, um, and create the right program of training for the new generation of scientists, which is not easy to make science um, attractive for the new generation as well, since uh, there are uh, disciplines that require a lot of time for studying um, and try to design this kind of program with the private sector and mentoring and internships. Wonderful. Kevin. Yeah. Just, just the importance of, of communication, sharing knowledge to really put the, put the innovations to work and remembering that, that uh, these, these changes that we're asking farmers to consider are risky for them and, and, and difficult and, and there's a, a big cost of error that, that, uh, or, or failure that they carry. Um, and so taking the time and, and not trying to be quick about it, but creating space where uh, farmers are able to really evaluate the options, hear the debates, hear the differing points, and make informed decisions. <laughs> That's the end of it. Um, I can give you a mic. To make informed decisions. <laughs>
<laughs> um, Claudia. I believe I still have a mic. You still got your uh, voice. Let me just say that I think what's so important to come out of this session is that we cannot solve the challenges that we're all committed to, hunger, climate, without engaging intentionally in concerns around gender equality and all social inclusion. We cannot solve global problems without global engagement, and that includes every gender. There's good evidence out there. There's good evidence of hard work that's been done and has really paid off. And we need to engage this intentionally and mindfully, just as you were saying, Elizabeth, in everything that we do uh, moving forward on, on climate and gender and hunger. And let me say again, I do hope that we will be able to launch an innovation sprint on climate and gender. And I do hope that many of you in the room will be inspired to join with us. Thank you. Say a very few words to close um, with gratitude to this panel, extraordinary uh, practitioners and leaders, all of you. Millions of women around the world produce our food and enable our food systems to function. And every day they are innovating in practical ways in response to myriad challenges. All of us depend on these women, but they don't yet have the full set of resources and tools they need fully to succeed. And as challenging as that reality is, and we've heard all the statistics this afternoon, the really exciting thing is, is that we can change it. And we've heard so many different ways that that's possible. So I hope that today's call to action and the insight and experience that you've heard um, from this wonderful panel has given you new inspiration to be very much a part of that change. And I just want to close by thanking you, our extraordinary. You have been so quiet throughout this entire conversation. So thank you to you. Thank you to our really extraordinary panel and to the ministers uh, who started us off this morning. Uh, give yourselves a big round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of our speakers and our panelists for an outstanding discussion and a special Thanks to the UN Foundation and USAID for convening an important session on women at the heart of our food systems investments. UN Foundation was one of the first Aim for Climate Knowledge partners. Thank you again, President Cousins. You and your team have been amazing partners since day one. This afternoon, we have another amazing program. In addition to the three breakout sessions that start at 2.30 and another three at 4, we have a robust program right here in the Grand Ballroom that starts at 2.30 in support of the Aim for Climate Call to Action, uniting global venture investment in support of climate smart agricultural innovation. That call to action was announced by Secretary Vilsack at COP27. This event will kick off with keynote remarks from the founder and CEO of Food Systems for the Future, Earthrun Cousin, and will include 50 incredible speakers to highlight the role of investment, innovation, and implementation, including the top finalists of the Aim for Climate Grand Challenge right here in the Grand Ballroom. This afternoon, please enjoy another coffee break sponsored by the Almond Board of California. And tomorrow morning, we will see you right back here in the plenary session about Aim for Climate's Road to COP28. Tomorrow morning's plenary will include a keynote remarks from John Kerry, special, United States Special Presidential Envoy for Climate, and Michael Kremer, Nobel Laureate and Professor at the University of Chicago, an exciting announcement to come from Michael Kremer and his team, as well as the announcement of the winner of the Aim for Climate Grand Challenge, leveraging the power of AI and machine learning by Enterprise Neurosystem. We'll round out the morning with a fireside chat between Secretary Vilsack and Minister Almaheri, moderated by the CEO of Foreign Policy, Andrew Sollinger. And we have a very special treat. You won't want to miss it. So please make sure you're here in plenary tomorrow morning, bright and early for a start. We'll see you back here at 9 a.m. for this historic plenary laying out the road ahead to COP28 first thing in the morning. Enjoy the call to action this afternoon. Thank you.